The Borean tundra is expansive, flat, and frigid. The terrain is diverse, with hard yet arable soil in the south transitioning to nourishing steam pools in the center. Along the western edge, formidable cliffs ascend and abruptly drop off into the west drift. The north is dominated by grasslands and a region of steep hills. To the northwest, the elevated island plateau of Koldara is visible. The east is blanketed in snow, presenting the harshest conditions the area has to offer. A river forms a natural boundary separating the Borean tundra from the dragon blight. Now scattered across the Borean tundra are stone elders crafted by the Tuskar. Varying in size from dwarf height to towering over houses, many of these statues are located along the coast, and as per Bran Bronzebeard, serve as markers for their fishing routes, though some have been spotted inland as well. Now I want to visit some locations that I think are interesting. First, let us start with Valiant's Keep, which is where Alliance players begin when they set foot on Borean Tundra. During the fierce conflict with the Lich King, the fortress was under relentless attack both externally and internally by the Lich King's forces. As the fortress walls were still under construction, scourged Nerubians erupted from the earth, revealing the Borean Tundra's infestation with spider tunnels. The fortress's walls were completed amidst regular assaults from Nerubian flame spitters. Inside the fortress, the Cult of the Damned had established a presence in Valiance. Thanks to the deceptive Counselor Talbot, who was in fact Sanlane Prince Valinar in disguise, he manipulated General Arlos to conceal the cult's activities and sent brave men to their deaths on feudal missions. He also sabotaged the Alliance's command structure and unleashed a plague on the town of Farshire, a crucial supplier to the fortress. The truth was uncovered just in time to save Valiant's Keep by the Draenei Harbinger Viren, whose investigation led to the exposure and capture of the infiltrating cultists. And thanks to the Death Knight Thessarion, who revealed Prince Valinar's schemes and defeated him, nearly losing his life in the process. After the war against the Jailer, the Bronzebeard brothers reported that the town remains active. They also noted that if the enemies from the Riplash ruins hadn't been repelled by adventurers, Valiant's Keep would have undoubtedly been their next target. Now we venture to where the Horde players begin their adventure in this land, Warsong Hold. Before the establishment of Warsong Hold, the Horde operated from Garrosh's Landing, a site named in honor of Garrosh Hellscream, who led the fleet of Orcish destroyers to the coast. This served as their primary port once they chose to construct their fortress inland, providing a strategic base for housing troops, planning strategies, and strengthening their grip on Northrend. A legion of peons were dispatched from Orgrimmar to construct this imposing fortress. They began by excavating the icy tundra stone surface, carving out colossal stone blocks. With the assistance of cranes, these blocks were strategically placed atop a hill they had excavated around. In a relatively short span of time, the fortress took shape. Upon the completion of the hold, the peons shifted their focus to fortifying the outer defenses, constructing a series of towers and gates around the perimeter of Mightstone Quarry. Garrosh Hellscream and Varrock Sourfang's plan for the fortress did not proceed without hitches. During construction, their workers inadvertently breached the subterranean layers of the Nerubar, scourged Nerubians, leading to the abduction of their people. Determined to protect Warsong Hold, Overlord Razgor rallied the Horde forces to counterattack. Quartermaster Holgoth, in an attempt to halt the onslaught on Warsong Hold, aimed to obliterate the sinkholes serving as the Nerubians' tunnels within the quarry. The relentless efforts of the Horde eventually forced the Nerubar to retreat. Simultaneously, the workers relocated to Warsong Hold were accommodated in modest shelters around the keep's base, which were subsequently seized by the Cult of the Damned. They wrecked havoc on the settlement and began to raise more undead minions for the Scourge forces. A few months prior to the Cataclysm, Karen Bloodhoof journeyed to Warsong Hold for a meeting with Garrosh Hellscream. With the Northrend War nearing its end, Garrosh was summoned back to Orgrimmar for a grand celebration in his honor, acknowledging the Horde's triumphs under his command. It was then disclosed that Varrock Sourfang, his trusty deputy, would stay behind at the Hold, leading the Horde's Northrend skeleton crew, the Warsong Offensive, and the Horde Expedition. As Garrosh and Karen prepared to transport the majority of the fortress and Warsong Offensive's forces back to Kalimdor, the Cavaldir launched another assault. However, they successfully evaded the attack and made their escape by sea. After the conflict with the Jailer, the Bronzebeard brothers relayed that the fortress, though still standing, was partially shrouded in webs, giving it an eerie, nightmarish appearance. We now travel to the east, to a village called Kaskala. Once a thriving Tuskar port on the eastern coast of the Borean Tundra, now lies in ruins. It was the former capital of the Tuskar, and their largest port until the Cavaldir longships emerged from the mists, initiating a brutal onslaught. The survivors sought refuge in Unope, to the east, where many remain. 
Cascala is known for its stone statues, which are said to house the spirits of departed Tuscar elders, making the Cavaldier invasion even more heartbreaking. After the battle with the Jailer, the Bronzebeard brothers encounter Tuscar who expressed their determination to reclaim Cascala. Despite their peaceful nature, they believe in exacting justice against those who have harmed their kin. We now venture to the southwest where we find the Riplash Strand and the Riplash Ruins. Riplash Strand is a coastal stretch that once fell under the dominion of the Naga. However, the ruthless Caval Deer invaded, seizing control. Scattered along the shore are remnants of Night Elf Ruins, likely an extension of the Riplash Ruins located further south. Once a grand Night Elven city stood here, its glory now reduced to a few half-standing structures scattered among drifting icebergs. The most preserved among them is a temple dedicated to a loon, though the goddess hasn't graced these grounds in ages. The ruins were claimed by the Riplash Naga after the Great Sundering, replacing a loon's presence with a statue of their queen Ajara. Half a millennium ago, the Riplash Naga were ruled by Emperor Raz Nazjan, when the formidable Kraken Leveroth was imprisoned in the waters beneath the ruins by Ajara herself. She bestowed a blessing upon his trident, ensuring it would slay the beast should it ever break free. The awakening of Rykul by the Lich King was not the only disturbance in Northrend. The North Sea Freebooters pirates, driven by sheer greed, brought the Cavaldeer to Northrend shores by pilfering artifacts from a Vrykul burial ground, thus disturbing the spirits of the deceased. One of these Cavaldeer clans, the Skadir, landed their longships at the ruins, annihilated the Naga, leaving only Viha, and claimed the ruins as their own, using them as a launching pad for their assaults in the Borean Tundra. During the war against the Lich King, Alliance adventurers were dispatched to the ruins to repel the Cavaldeer. As Valiant's Keep was next in the line of fire, the Skadir had plans to resurrect Leveroth, with one of their leaders, Ragnar Drakarlund, found wielding the trident of Nazjan in an attempt to awaken the beast. Viha later commanded his demise, as well as that of the Kraken. In the aftermath of the war against the Jailer, the Bronzebeard brothers reported that the Skadir continued to summon their accursed mist over the area, obscuring a clear view of the ruins. Finally, we shoot northwest to Kuldara. During the War of the Ancients, Maligos, the dragon who suffered the loss of most of his dragon flight at the hands of Deathwing and the Demon Soul, sought refuge in the icy solitude of Kuldara. Here, he spent millennia spiraling into madness. Before the onset of the Nexus War, the island's surface and the surrounding waters began to crack open, revealing rifts that oozed with magical energy. These were the ominous signs of Maligos' scheming, causing minor tremors that rippled along the coastline. As the Nexus War unfolded, the Blue Dragonflight expanded their reach to the neighboring regions of Northrend, utilizing Kuldara as a training ground for the newly hatched warriors. The Kirin Tor in response established a camp known as Transitus Shield on the outskirts of Kuldara. Maligos perceived an overuse of arcane magic by mortal spellcasters across Azeroth. Determined to rectify this issue in his own manner, he resolved to incarcerate and annihilate all mortal mages, redirecting the flow of magic towards Kuldara. Now we move on to the Nexus, and it has quite a bit of history, so let's get into it. In the ancient past, the Titans entrusted Maligos with the guardianship of magic. However, the War of the Ancients brought about a catastrophe, as Deathwing nearly annihilated the Blue Flight, scattering the survivors to the winds. Foreseeing the impending doom, Coryal Straws braved the magical defenses of Maligos' lair to protect the abandoned Blue Eggs. Overwhelmed by sorrow, Maligos retreated into the depths of the Nexus paying scant attention to the world for thousands of years. Fast forward to four millennia later, a band of Shandarel highborn sorcerers dared to infiltrate the Nexus, seeking to unravel its magical secrets. They succeeded in uncovering the dragon's magical techniques, but their greed led them to pilfer potent artifacts. This act of theft activated the Nexus's magical defenses, plunging the surviving blue dragons into a frenzy. The highborn thieves managed to flee, but the dragons exacted their vengeance on Chandarel. Sometime later, in a moment of cosmic manipulation, the blue dragons pierced the veil of reality, making contact with a peculiar arcane being known as Alunith. Their fascination with Alunith's existence led them to summon it into Azeroth for a closer examination. Upon arrival, Alunith wrecked havoc throughout the Nexus, annihilating numerous invaluable artifacts and power-laden tomes before it was finally restrained. Rather than expressing outrage at the destruction, the dragons were thrilled by Alunus's unpredictable nature. After years of conducting benign experiments on Alunus, the blue dragon's curiosity was quenched, and they returned the entity to its original realm. 
Many years later, Aluneth found itself bound within the Grand Staff of the Guardian of Tiris Fall. After Medivh's demise, Aegwin passed the staff to the Kirin Tor, who safeguarded it in the Nexus Fault. Following the conclusion of the Second War, Coryalstras, a member of the Red Dragon Flight, ventured into Maligos's sacred haven. He was met with a chilling sight of ice trolls, wendigos, orcs, an elf, and even naga, all frozen in time. Left his eerie reminders of the Dragon Aspect's presence. It was Coryalstras who finally persuaded Maligos to step out from his seclusion by offering him a glimmer of hope the chance to exact revenge for Deathwing's heinous act. Despite the obliteration of the Demon Soul, Deathwing had managed to survive, leading Maligos to retreat once more into his prolonged solitude. Now we move on to the Nexus War, although sometimes it is called the Nexus Wars. Upon the Dark Portal's revival, Tiragosa, the Azure Dragon, ushered Zaraku and his fellow Nether Dragons to the Nexus, a sanctuary for them to rejuvenate through its potent energies. Yet the Nexus's power was so overwhelming that they chose to seize it for themselves. They began to siphon its energy, vowing to never fall under the control of the orcs or any other being. Arigos and his blue dragon kin stepped in to shield the Nexus, but it was Maligos, emerging from his isolation, who annihilated the nether dragons and reclaimed their energies. This act fully awakened him to the world's current state. Regaining his full consciousness, Maligos swiftly evaluated Azeroth's magical landscape and came to a bleak conclusion. Magic was spiraling out of control. He attributed this perilous trend to the mortal races and their reckless quest for magical prowess. Determined to avert a disaster, Maligos declared that the rampant magic must be curtailed by any means necessary. He sought guidance from the Arcanomicon, a map of the world's ley lines bestowed upon him eons ago by the Titan Norganon, which had been meticulously updated and refined by the Blue Dragonflight. Utilizing the map, Maligos pinpointed and harnessed the ley lines, channeling the subterranean magical currents towards the Nexus. Here, the energies were amplified through the Nexus's spiraling rings and catapulted into the Twisting Nether. This redirection of ley lines, however, had catastrophic repercussions, fracturing the world's crust and creating unstable rifts, literal tears in the fabric of existence. The immense flow of Azeroth's arcane energy through the Nexus also altered its structure, a colossal dimensional rift was ripped open within the caverns, birthing arcane anomalies within its corridors and transmuting the singing gardens and its protectors into crystalline entities. The mortal races did not overlook Maligos' draining of the world's magic. The Kirin Tor, with their dwindling powers, relocated the entire city of Dalaran to hover above Northrend. Enraged by what he saw as the mortals' blatant disregard for the world's future, Maligos declared war on them, igniting the conflict known as the Nexus War. However, the Kirin Tor was not entirely united. A few members chose to align with the Blue Dragonflight in a bid to maintain power. Empowered and transformed by Maligos, these mage hunters were assigned to seek out and, if necessary, obliterate magical artifacts, to detain or eliminate individuals practicing magic without Maligos' consent, and to assist in the redirection of ley lines using colossal constructs known as Surge Needles. A number of them were welcomed into the Nexus to continue their duties and defend it from intrusion. The escalating militant approach of the Blue Dragonflight drew the ire of the Red Dragonflight. Tasked with the safeguarding of life, they pledged to neutralize Maligos and formed an alliance with the Kirin Tor to counteract Maligos' destructive campaign. During the war, Maligos incarcerated the Red Dragon Kiri Straza within the Nexus, with the intention of coercing her into becoming his new mate. The Kirin Tor and Red Dragonflight eventually besieged the Nexus, enabling the Horde and Alliance to infiltrate its halls and vanquish many of Maligos' most formidable allies. Ultimately, adventurers ventured into the Eye of Eternity to confront Maligos himself. Despite the aspects unleashing of his arcane power, they managed to slay Maligos with the assistance of Alexstrasza, thus concluding the Nexus War and leaving the Blue Dragonflight without a leader. However, later on, Caligos would be chosen as the new Blue Dragon Aspect. I did what I had to, brother. You gave me no alternative. And so ends the Nexus War. This resolution pains me deeply, but the destruction, the monumental loss of life had to end. Regardless of Malagos's recent transgressions, I will mourn his loss. He was once a guardian, a protector. This day, 
one of the world's mightiest, has fallen. The Red Dragon Blight will take on the burden of mending the devastation wrought on Azeroth. Return home to your people and rest. Tomorrow will bring you new challenges, and you must be ready to face them. Life goes on. Originally known as Moonsong Forest, the outpost of Shandarel, buried amidst the height of the Kaldurai Empire, emerged as a sanctuary for arcane wonders amassed by the Highborn, which were the upper class in the Night Elf civilization. Around 10,000 years before the Dark Portal, as ancient Kalimdor bore witness to the cataclysmic Great Sundering, Shandarel found itself severed from the world. Left powerless and vulnerable, the elves embarked on a centuries-long quest in the Moonsong Woods, seeking the magic to sustain them and hoping to find salvation. Around 6,000 years before the Dark Portal, after the Highborn witnessed a fascinating sight of the Blue Dragons crystallizing things and drawing power from them, they knew they had to investigate and see about learning the magic for themselves. Knowing that the dragons would never teach them, they had to infiltrate the Nexus. But the sorcerers, being driven by greed, pilfered relics which triggered the rage of the Blue Dragon flight. Their pilfering sent the dragons into a frenzy, and while they escaped with their lives, the dragons weren't done with them, and would have their revenge. Many of the blue dragons descended upon Shandarel, but the elves decided to use the techniques that they had acquired from within the Nexus. Focusing their power, they hoped to crystallize a small portion of the forest, and use that as a weapon to destroy the dragons, but they failed. Their reckless casting caused an explosion which released a giant torrent of energy that crystallized the entire forest, thus giving it the name Crystal Song Forest. Shattering the physical forms of life, survivors morphed into maddened crystal entities, epitomized by the likes of crystal satyrs and dryads. Only the four-sided blue dragons escaped the impending spellwork, leaving the land to be plagued by wandering spirits. The unbound, remnants of shattered civilization, now meander through the ruins of their ancient abode. Approximately 4,500 years before the Dark Portal, Vandral Staghelm, in a bid to thwart the spread of Sauronite, planted Nordrasil branches across Northrend. One such branch took root in Crystal Song, evolving into a great tree, adding a meaningful page to the magical history of the land. As the war against the Lich King unfolded, the enchanting city of Dalaran, a bastion of magic, defied convention by being teleported to hover over Crystal Song Forest, a stone's throw from Ice Crown's ominous presence. Beneath this floating marvel, the Violet Stand emerged an outpost shielded by a magical barrier against external threats. The Silver Covenant and Sun Reavers, drawn by the beckoning mysteries, staked their claims in the vicinity, transforming the remains of Windrunner's Overlook and Sun Reaver's Command into their respective domains. These were once proud highborn towers, now haunting echoes of a bygone era. In tandem with the Nexus War's unfolding drama, the relentless blue dragonflight, hot on the heels of the Kirin Tor, established the Azure Front, Amidst the crystalline landscape, surge needles punctured the azure skies, marking the dragon's strategic presence in a dance of arcane supremacy. Thus, the stage was set for a collision of magical forces, weaving a tapestry of intrigue over the hollowed grounds of Crystal Song Forest. In the wake of the Lich King's demise, the intrepid Bronzebeard brothers revisited the frigid landscapes in Northrend, chronicling their post-war escapades. Amidst their observations, a curious absence caught their attention. The once majestic Violet Stand had vanished leaving only whispers of its mysterious past. Yet scattered across the icy expanse, other outposts endured, silent witnesses to the ebb and flow of time. As the remnants of conflict lingered, the Azure Front persisted as a steadfast outpost. Its surge needles now rendered inert. However, the Azure skies remained vigilant, patrolled by the ever-watchful Dragonkin, a testament to the enduring presence of ancient forces. Meanwhile, the Sun Reavers and Silver Covenant maintained their foothold in the region. In the mystical embrace of Crystal Song Forest, the Unbound Thicket emerges as a dominant force, a realm entrenched in mystery within the eastern reaches. Its boundaries weave a cryptic tapestry, with Sun Reaver's command to the north, the haunting Zoldrak to the east, the echoes of Windrunner's Overlook to the south, and the somber forlorn woods guarding its western flank. Amidst this thicket lies the ruins of Shandarel, nestled just east of a crystalline sentinel. A dance of energy unfolds in this realm where every tree bears the signature touch of crystal, and the very ground beneath fissured and leaking magical energies pulses with an otherworldly rhythm. The wind itself, a spectral whisper through crystal leaves, adds an eerie symphony to this surreal landscape. 
In the unbound thicket, the remnants of the once majestic highborn echo through ghostly apparitions and twisted maddened creatures. A perilous dance ensues where every glance may provoke the ire of these crystalline phantoms, as the forest holds its secrets close, guarded by the ancient and the arcane. In southern Crystal Song Forest, the puzzling azure front unveils itself southeast of the ethereal violet stand. Amidst the ancient trees, a captivating display of artifacts belonging to the majestic blue dragonflight graces the area. The heart of their power emanates from a colossal crystal tree, adorned with a mesmerizing chain of three surge needles. Strikingly, a fourth surge needle adorned with a distinctive crystal stands guard between this sanctum and the revered violet stand. During the tumultuous Nexus War, this very enclave served as the battleground where the formidable blue dragonflight contested against Dalaran and the Curantor. A historical testament to the clash of powers resonates within the whispers of the trees. Years later, in the aftermath of the arduous conflict against the Jailer, the renowned Bronzebeard brothers chronicled their observations in a report. They recounted a lingering aura of magic, with surge needles suspended in the air like dormant guardians of bygone battles. Though no longer pulsating with active energy since the Nexus War's end, the needles bore silent witness to eons of struggle. Intriguingly, the brothers noted the lingering presence of Blue Dragonkin, once a formidable invading force now reduced to a mere fraction. The winds of change had swept through the forest, leaving behind remnants of a bygone era, where dragons clashed and the very essence of magic hung in delicate balance. Nature's canvas is painted by the twilight rivulet, gracefully slicing through the woods from the decrepit flow, leading its journey towards the puzzling mirror of twilight. Above this rustic sanctuary, Dalaran floats with ethereal grace, a celestial city in the heavens. Here, autumn lingers eternally, casting a golden and red-brown hue upon the landscape. Amongst the vibrant foliage stand the melancholic ruins of elven structures, whispers of a forgotten era that adds a poignant touch to the woodland's allure. Murmurs of Murd and Bronzebeard declare this haven to be the safest refuge in the region, a sanctuary to rest one's weary soul, or halt for a comforting rest beneath the canopy of perpetual autumn. In the trial of conflict, the mages of the Violet Stand wove a tapestry of protection, erecting a magical shield dome that shimmered defiantly against the looming threat of the Blue Dragonflight during the Nexus War. Amidst the remnants of arcane defenses, the ground bears witness to the haunting aftermath. The lifeless forms of Blue Dragonspawn, fallen soldiers in the nearby azure front scattered like tragic echoes in the ruins. Scorched earth and burnt holes tell a tale of battles waged and victory uncertain. Yet. As the echoes of war settled, the Brothers Bronzebeard penned a somber chapter in the Violet Stand's history. The Kirin Tor, once guardians of these mystical ruins, departed after the Jailer's defeat. Now the landscape bears witness to the silent decay of once majestic towers, draped in vines and smoldering craters, lingering scars left by the Blue Dragonkin, a poignant reminder of the fleeting nature of arcane splendor. In the echoes of its frozen past, Wintergrass reveals a transformation. Once cradling the expansive Lake Wintergrasp, now a basin laid bare for exploration. A coveted mine lies at its heart, a trove of riches entwined in a ceaseless dance of contention between the Horde and the Alliance. In the aftermath of the Jailer's defeat, the saga persists, an enduring skirmish that refuses to yield. Murd and Bronzebeard, wise and weathered, contemplates the significance of these relics. He warns against messing with the Titan's protective seal and reflects on the irony that the relics meant for safety could cause conflict. He encourages both factions to rethink their constant fighting for the sake of peace. His brother, Bran Bronzebeard, wears the curiosity of an adventurer, eager to unveil the tales and powers dormant within these artifacts. Yet a thread of caution weaves through his words, advocating restraint until the world teeters on the precipice of global catastrophe. In this frigid theater of conflict, the question lingers. Are these relic keys to salvation or conduits to chaos? So the only thing I couldn't really find like concrete information on was what caused the crystal part of the forest to get taken over by the forlorn woods. Now, in the wiki, it says that the entire forest got turned to the crystalline structures and forests and everything that we see in the unbound thicket and the azure front. However, my thinking is that when the great tree was planted, the roots and everything was able to push the crystal back and break through and let the natural forest grow to an extent. I'm thinking like parts where there was more magic or more just powerful aspects to the forest or just more concentration of magic is where the tree wasn't able to really break through and 
let the Forlorn Woods take over all of it. That's my best guess, but let me know your guess down below. In the heart of a vast arctic wilderness, encircled by dense forests, lies a landscape strewn with the gleaming skeletal remains of fallen dragons. Dominating this frozen expanse is the Wormrest Temple, a structure of ancient origin, believed to have been erected by the titans in the early days of Azeroth's creation. It is within this fortress that the five mighty dragon aspects are said to have received their blessings and their duty to safeguard the developing world. This sacred connection to the dragon kind might explain why dragons nearing their life's end journey to the dragon blight to enrich the land with their final breath. Five majestic dragon shrines, each representing a color, red, bronze, green, blue, and black, encircle the Wormrest Temple. Each shrine is imbued with the unique powers of its respective flight. However, these shrines are under siege by the undead Scourge, who seek to raise new, horrifying forms of undead dragons to serve the Lich King. In response to this threat, Alexstrasza has started rallying heroes to join the fight against the Scourge. Simultaneously, the Tonka and Tuskar are engaged in their own desperate struggles against the undead. The Scarlet Onslaught, formerly the Scarlet Crusade, has also arrived, hoping to triumph in their ongoing battle against the Lich King and his minions. Both the Alliance and Horde have started to establish a foothold in the Dragonblight, focusing particularly on the sealed entrance to Icecrown, Angrathar the Wrathgate. Here, both factions are preparing for the inevitable siege that will lead them into the Lich King's lair. However, the threats in the Dragonblight are not solely from the Lich King. The Blue Dragonflight, under the command of the Blue Dragon Aspect Maligos, is determined to bend all existing magic to his will. Maligos has directed his flight to position massive machines over key ley line clusters, believed to be part of a plan to realign the magical energy paths beneath the world. If successful, this could trigger an ecological and magical disaster that could destabilize not just Northrend, but the entire world. Despite its predominantly icy landscape, Dragonblight boasts several locations with drastically different terrains. The most striking of these are the Dragon Shrines, each with its unique environment. The Obsidian Dragon Shrine with its lava, the Emerald Dragon Shrine with its tropical forest, and the Bronze Dragon Shrine with its desert. 823 years before the Dark Portal, the renowned Aegwyn journeyed to the Dragonblight to assist the Dragon Flights in expelling a horde of demons that were siphoning the potent arcane energies of the Blue Dragons. As a final demon was exiled from the world, the avatar of Sargeras emerged to challenge her. While Aegwyn did win the fight with the demon, it was at a cost she was unaware she had paid. Sargeras had transferred a portion of his spirit into her soul. With this, Sargeras darkened her thoughts and drove her to distance herself from the Council of Tirisfall, which is an order that was formed of human, gnome, and high elven mages charged with protecting Azeroth from the demons. But without knowing it, Aegwyn passed the dark spirit of Sargeras onto her son, Medivh. Upon reaching the Howling Fjord in his pursuit of Malganus, Prince Arthas directed his fleet and soldiers toward the northwest, to the Dragonblight. It was here that an alliance messenger delivered King Tyrannus' command to withdraw the expedition, and here that Arthas ordered the destruction of his own ships, effectively marooning his forces in Northrend. A few days later, Arthas found himself under attack from Malganus' superior forces leading him to seek the power of Frostmourne in a northern cave. When Arthas, now a Death Knight, returned to Northrend after laying waste to the northern territories of Lordaeron, heeding the Lich King's summons to battle Illidan Stormrage, his initial base was established on the southern shore of the Dragonblight. Now when I was going through this, I actually found something kind of interesting. Aside from everything else. Maligos and his blue dragonflight fiercely protect the dragon bones scattered across the valley. However, the rise of the Lich King and his Scourge has led to the desecration of many of these graves, with the bones being used to create the Frostworms for the Scourge's army. Which I didn't know that that was where the Frostworms came from. Another random fact for you is that a human settlement once stood here. However, roughly two years following the conclusion of the Second War, it fell victim to the Lich King's devastating plague of undeath, which were the first humans to fall victim to the plague. It's not a happy little random fact for you, but it's a random fact you can know. Now let's talk about Nax Ramus. Long ago, Anubarak, the Crypt Lord, spearheaded a legion of undead warriors into the ancient Nerubian Ziggurat, which we now recognize as Nax Ramus. The Citadel succumbed to the relentless onslaught of Scourge forces, and guided by the Lich King's command, its once hospitable corridors metamorphosized into a formidable war engine. Empowered by dark enchantments, the fortress was violently uprooted from its subterranean abode, ascending into the heavens veiled by an impenetrable layer of clouds. Within this concealed realm, Naxxramas grew quickly in malevolent might, 
Obedient to the Lich King's will, the unleashed fury dwelling within the necropolis was poised to wreak havoc upon the unsuspecting world. Naxxramas journeyed back to Lordaeron, becoming the epicenter of a devastating plague that swept across the land. Engaged in a relentless war against the Scarlet Crusade, Argent Dawn, the Forsaken, and the Alliance as human forces, Kel'Thuzad found his dominion in the Plaguelands besieged by adventurers from diverse races and nations. Faced with these unyielding challenges, Kel'Thuzad's forces strained to maintain Naxxramas' security. However, the once concealed gates now stand ajar, unleashing Kel'Thuzad's fresh legions, swiftly obliterating all who opposed the relenting might of the Scourge. Now in WoW initially, Nax was nestled within the ominous Plaguewood. The entrance to Naxxramas, a foreboding rune portal, stood impervious to all prior attempts to entry due to formidable magical wards. However, the Argent Dawn unraveled the secret using arcane cloaking, a Kirintor cantrip or weaker spell crafted under the skillful adjustments of Archmage Angela de Santos. Amidst the inaugural Scourge invasion, Stormwind City faced a relentless assault sparking an alliance counteroffensive. Alliance heroes, rallied by Bolvar Fordragon, undertook a daring raid on Naxxramas. Their courageous exploits unfolded within the Dread Citadel, culminating in the defeat of Abominations, Death Knights, and the formidable Kel'Thuzad himself. With Kel'Thuzad defeated, all seemed good. The adventurers gave his phylactery, which is a container that holds the life force or soul of the Lich, and can be used to regenerate the Lich with enough power fed into it. Only way to actually destroy a Lich for good is to destroy their phylactery. Adventurers gave his phylactery to a priest named Anigo Montoy, who was thought to be a trusted ally, but betrayed the Argent Dawn and the adventurers and was working for the Lich King the whole time. Montoy took Kel'Thuzad back to the Lich King, and then the Lich King brought him back to life with the help of the Sunwell energy. With him revived, Naxxramas was brought to Northrend to aid Arthas in his plan, and Kel'Thuzad returned to his lair, where within the necropolis the tide of the battle could turn against the Lich King or be forever in his favor. Grizzly Hills is a picturesque and diverse zone characterized by dense forests, rugged mountains, and scenic lakes. It offers a captivating blend of natural beauty and untamed wilderness. The region is home to various wildlife, including bears, furbolgs, and other creatures. The zone has a rich history, with ancient ruins and the remnants of Thor Modan, a city once inhabited by dwarves, contributing to its lore. In ancient times, the Grizzly Hills were the playful abode of two brothers, Ursok and Ursal mischievous bear cubs with insatiable curiosity. Despite venturing into the territories of larger predators, they stood together in the face of danger. Impressed by their unwavering bond, Keeper Freya transformed them into wild gods, imbuing them with nature's power. Fast forward 4,500 years before the First War, and Fandral Staghelm's bold act of planting Nordrasil branches over Sauronite changed the fate of the Grizzly Hills. The towering Andrasil, or Crown of the Snow, which was planted on a particularly large Sarnite deposit born from this daring experiment, initially thrived. Yet unforeseen consequences arose as Andrasil's roots reached the subterranean prison of yogg saron corrupting the once majestic tree and causing races like the Tonka and the Forest Nymphs to be in constant conflict when before they were peaceful with each other. The Cenarian Circle, realizing the threat, faced the heartbreaking choice of destroying Andrasil, renaming it Vordrasil, or Broken Crown. Little did they know, Yogg-Saron's dark influence had seeped into the Emerald Dream, sowing the seeds of corruption. These seeds, nurtured by the Dream's ethereal realm, gave rise to the infamous Emerald Nightmare. The repercussions of their actions extended far beyond the felling of Andrasil. In the aftermath, the Firbolg tribes embraced the stump left behind, constructing Grizzlemaw, a settlement that housed a massive prehistoric bear deity. As generations passed, the Firbolgs continued their reverence while a secluded human population thrived in the woods, detached from the Seven Kingdoms, sustaining themselves as skilled trappers. Thus the Grizzly Hills' ancient tale weaves a tapestry of gods, corruption, and the enduring spirit of those who called these unmatched lands home. In the enchanting landscape of Grizzly Hills, traces of the once mighty Vordrasil linger. Scattered in the form of its heart, limb, and tears, these significant remnants bear witness to the Night Elves' decisive act of felling the colossal tree ages ago. Venture into this region, you will discover a peculiar sight. The ground beneath, covered in a living ooze, a tangible reminder of the corruption that once gripped Vordrasil's towering presence. Explore the remnants, where nature's beauty intertwines with echoes of an ancient struggle against the malevolent forces. We travel now to Ursok's den, the lair of the wild god Ursok, renowned for his epic clash with the Burning Legion during the War of the Ancients. Positioned northwest of the Westfall Brigade encampment, Carved from solid rock, it takes the form of a colossal bear's head, 
with its mouth serving as the entrance to a natural canyon. Within this remarkable sanctuary, Ursok made his dwelling thousands of years ago, leaving an enduring mark on the rugged landscape of Azeroth. During the conflict against the Lich King, the Grizzlemaw Furbolgs, gripped by madness, sought to revive the spirit of Ursok. Yet the malevolent touch of the old god yogg saron tainted the noble endeavor. It wasn't until Tur Ragepaw, a shaman from the Timbermaw tribe, along with a group of intrepid adventurers, ventured into the den that the corruption was purged. In a courageous act, they freed the spirit of the wild god, restoring Ursok to his untainted essence. Now within Grizzly Hills, there are two areas for Alliance and Horde. For the Horde, there is the Conquest Hold, and for Alliance, there is Amber Pine Lodge. Amber Pine Lodge is a captivating haven nestled within the enchanting Grizzly Hills. Picture this, a rustic lodge surrounded by towering pine trees, their amber hues blending seamlessly with the natural beauty of the landscape. The air is filled with the comforting scent of pine needles and the distant sounds of wildlife add to the lodge's tranquil charm. The lodge stands as the main gathering point for the Alliance in the western Grizzly Hills. Originally crafted by Alliance-affiliated hunters and woodsmen as a meeting hall, it became a vital outpost during the war against the Lich King when Lieutenant Dumont and Valiant's expedition forces took command of it for military purposes. In the post-war era, the Lodge has gracefully returned to its tranquil origins, embracing more peaceful pursuits once again. Now we move over to Conquest Hold, where we see formidable fortress walls encircling a deep, echoing fighting pit, where the clashes of strength and skill resonate through the air. During the tumultuous war against the Lich King, the Hold was under the firm command of Conqueror Krenna, an orc known for her aggressive demeanor, even by the Horde's robust standards. Her rule extended over the forces stationed within the fortress. In a surprising turn of events, fate unfolded within the very pit she ruled. A challenge arose, not from an external force, but from within. Krenna found herself pitted against her own sister, Gorgana, in a fierce showdown. The echoes of battle faded, leaving Gorgana as a triumphant victor. With the changing of the guard, Gorgana emerges as a new leader of Conquest Hold, steering its destiny in the Grizzly Hills. Now in Northeast Grizzly Hills, we have an area named Thormodan. This is a city being besieged by earthen and stone giants. The Iron Dwarves, masters of the outskirts of Thormodan, seemingly hold a sturdy grip on the city's edge, but appearances deceive. For venturing deeper into Thormodan reveals a city devastated by unseen forces. Among the remnants, the unfortunate aftermath of the Crossfire claims members of the Explorers League. Their trappings scattered across the landscape. Journal pages and regrettably the remains of those who ventured in and never returned paint a somber picture. For those of the Alliance on a quest in this troubled region, a noble mission awaits. Aid the Explorers League in retrieving valuable excavation information from fallen comrades. Yet the call for assistance doesn't end there. On the highest point overlooking Thormodan stands Curran, a colossal earth giant, leading an army against the Iron Dwarves' sinister machinations. The discerning adventurer can lend their strength to Curran's cause, battling alongside the giants in the Boulder Hills area, where a fierce clash unfolds. The Iron Forge Dwarf Explorers Guild, in their relentless pursuit of knowledge about the Titans and their origins of the race, undertakes excavations in Thormodan. Their quest for enlightenment repels them into the heart of conflict, inviting brave souls to join their cause and uncover the mysteries that lie within the battered city's ruins. During their Northrend journey, the Bronzebeard brothers encountered Thormodan. While the Iron Dwarves aligned with the uncorrupted forces of Ulduar, the Earthen in this region served the Stone Giants, maintaining a perpetual conflict with their Iron Dwarf counterparts. Amidst this strife, the city faced ongoing bombardment by the Stone Giants, preventing any attempts at rebuilding. Consequently, the Iron Dwarves found themselves compelled to relocate to Dun Argol, seeking refuge from the relentless attacks. South of Thormodan, we have Dun Argol. Guided by the indomitable Iron Thane Furyhammer, the city rose to prominence as the capital of the Iron Dwarves after the fall of Thormodan, succumbing to relentless destruction by the Stone Giants. The Explorers League sent prospectors Gan, Gorgan, and Varana, and their mission is to unearth the rich history of Dun Argol. Little did they expect the bustling population and were unfortunately taken captive by the Iron Dwarves. Luckily for them, adventurers later swooped in to rescue them from their unexpected predicament. As noted by the perceptive Bronzebeard brothers, Dun Argyll stands as a testament to the Northrend Titanic style. Marvel at the intricate runes adorning every surface, unveiling the city's unique charm and storied past. Explore the secrets concealed within the heart of Dun Argyll, where history and adventures intertwine in the frosty landscapes of Northrend. Venture south of Drak'theron Keep in the Grizzly Hills, and you'll stumble upon the unique village of Zab Halak, 
Imagine a cluster of quaint troll huts enveloping a ziggurat crowned by a colossal stone head known as the Seer of Zabhalak. Before the clash with the Lich King, a dark fate befell the village, succumbing to the scourge even before the Alliance set foot in Northrend. The once thriving Drakari trolls met a tragic end, leaving Zabhalak in ruins. In the aftermath of the war against the Jailer, the intrepid Bronzebeard brothers explored the desolate remnants of Zabhalak. Their report painted a haunting picture, a once vibrant village reduced to ruins, now haunted by wandering ghouls with no purpose or direction. The echoes of history linger in the quietude of this forsaken place. South of Zabhalak, you'll find Venture Bay, once a relatively quiet spot utilized by the Venture Company for their ventures. It transformed into a fierce battleground during the war against the Lich King. The Alliance, represented by scouts from the Westfall Brigade encampment, clashed relentlessly with the Horde's forces from Conquest Hold, each vying for control of the strategic harbor. In the aftermath of the war against the Jailer, the Venture Company once again claimed dominion over the harbor, converting it into a hub for mining and deforestation endeavors. Muradin Bronzebeard's insightful reports noted a surprising twist. The Alliance and Horde, having set aside their differences, no longer waged war over Venture Bay. Instead, a glimmer of hope emerged hinting at the possibility that these once rival factions might one day join forces against the common threat posed by the Venture Company. In the ancient days of Grizzly Hills, two adventurous bear cub brothers, Ursok and Ursul, roamed together. These brothers, fueled by curiosity, often wandered into the territories of larger predators. Surprisingly undeterred by danger and the refusal to leave each other's side, their unbreakable bond caught the eye of Keeper Freya. As the brothers got older, they became the true kings of Grizzly Hills towering over their fellow bears with unmatched size and strength. And as an added bonus, they didn't feel the effects of getting older. Recognizing their potential, she first saw their transformation into wild gods due to their unwavering dedication to each other. As they matured, Ursoc's protective nature emerged, feeling a duty to preserve Azeroth's wilds. He and other wild gods were bestowed unique weapons by Freya. These artifacts held untapped strength depending on the skill of their wielders. To unleash their true potential, practice, care, and self-improvement were essential. While some wild gods overlooked Freya's gifts, neglecting their weapons, Ursoc stood out. He grasped the significance, dedicating himself to mastering the power within his unique weapon. In this way, Ursoc and Ursul became a shining example of a wild god who understood and embraced the true potential of his crafted artifact. Like Ursoc's claws, crafted from titan steel and infused with Eonar's essence, Eonar was actually the original titan who infused part of her power into Freya, so that way Freya can do what she does. Ursoc wholeheartedly embraced the gift, tirelessly training alongside his brother, who wielded a magic-enhancing staff. Which I have no clue how Ursul wielded a staff as a bear, but that's what the wiki says, so I'm going with it. Their dedication paid off, making them among the most potent wild gods. Ursoc's titan steel claws became an extension of himself while Ursul mastered the manipulation of magic. Together, they emerged as Azeroth's formidable defenders. In time, Ursoc and Ursul joined Keeper Freya on her journeys across Azeroth. She shared her concerns about ominous forces and the brothers made it their duty to safeguard her. During their travels, they glimpsed the Emerald Dream, Freya's creation for guiding Azeroth's natural life. Drawn to its untouched wilderness, they immersed themselves in the dream's vibrant vision of nature. Then came a day when Freya sought solitude. Her words seemed like a farewell to Ursoc and Ursul, and before parting, she imparted more wisdom on their weapons and gifts, urging them to stay prepared. Azeroth will need you. If you're not ready, the world may crumble, she warned. However, the wild gods never saw her again. The same darkness that had ensnared Keeper Loken also tainted her mind. During a battle against the old gods' servants, Ursoc fought alongside a tauren named Aruna High Mountain. Recognizing the impending darkness, he blessed Aruna's spear, Talonclaw, previously blessed by another wild god named Onara. As time unfolded, Ursoc became a father to his son Orson and daughter Kodian, extending his legacy within the realms of Azeroth. During the War of the Ancients, Azeroth faced an unparalleled threat, the Burning Legion. Having corrupted key figures like Lord Xavius among the elven civilization near the Well of Eternity, unleashed its might upon the world. Malfurion called upon the Wild Gods to counter the demonic onslaught. The first responders were Ursoc and Ursul, charging into battle against the Legion's Doomguard. They struck the initial blows in the clash between Azeroth's untamed realms and the twisted army of the fallen Titan. Facing daunting odds, the brothers engaged in a fierce struggle. Without a moment's hesitation, they stood firm, 
undeterred even as the full wrath of the Burning Legion descended upon them. In this fierce fight against the Legion, many wild gods met their end. Ursul and Ursok, however, stood side by side, utilizing Freya's bestowed gifts to repel waves of demonic foes. Despite their valiant efforts, their strength had its limits. An unrelenting surge of fell stalkers ultimately overwhelmed them, leading to their demise. Together their spirits journeyed to the Emerald Dream, where they lingered for millennia. In the physical realm, Ursok's legacy was embodied solely in his claws. As the battle shifted elsewhere, a young Furbolg stumbled upon these titan steel claws. Recognizing their origin, he brought them to his tribe. Across generations, the Furbolgs revered the claws as the ultimate symbol of their bear god Ursok, the enduring testament of a fallen hero. However, wielding these powerful claws proved perilous for most Furbolgs, inducing an uncontrollable bloodlust that struck both friends and foe. Ursok's spirit, residing in the Emerald Dream, observed the chaos caused by his once mighty weapon. Realizing the Furbolgs' inability to control the claws, Ursok withdrew his spirit from them until a worthy champion arose. In time, a group of druids of the claw seized the now powerless claws from the Furbolgs and returned them to Ursok's spirit within the dream. The tale of the titan steel claws of Ursok unfolds, carrying the weight of sacrifice, reverence, and the quest for a worthy bearer. During the war against the Lich King, the Furbolgs of Grizzlemaw faced the encroaching grip of madness. Desperate, they sought to resurrect Ursok using the mystical energy of the ill-fated tree, Vordrasil. However, the lingering corruption within the tree seeped into both the Furbolgs and Ursok upon revival, corrupting them both. Tur Ragepaw, along with a brave group of adventurers, confronted and cleansed Ursok's spirit within his own cave, breaking the dark hold of corruption. Grateful for their aid, Ursok imparted a dire warning about the old god Yogg Saron, the sinister force behind Vordrasil's demise. Since his second demise in the Grizzly Hills, Ursok's spirit found solace in the embrace of the Emerald Dream. A brave druid adventurer seeking the claws of Ursok for the battle against the Burning Legion encountered a challenge. Satyrs, servants of the Emerald Nightmare, sought to claim Ursok's domain within the dream for themselves, tainting it for the relentless pursuit of the coveted claws. With the blessing of Ursul, the adventurer embarked on a quest to obtain the claws. Together with Ursok, they fought off the Nightmare's minions only to fall into a cunning trap orchestrated by Xavius. Despite Ursok's confident proclamation that Xavius couldn't face a god, the Nightmare Lord, shaped by the powers of the Old Gods, captured Ursok nonetheless. In the Emerald Dreamway, a son of Ursok guided the Archdruid of the Dream Grove to acquire the essence of tenacity from Rock Mora, aiming to power the Idol of the Wild and commune with Malorn. As Malorn became ensnared in an Emerald Nightmare recreation of his death, fragments of Ursok and Ursul battled demons during the War of the Ancients. Ursok emerged as a formidable boss in the Emerald Nightmare Raid, set in a distorted version of Grizzly Hills within the Nightmare's clutches. The veil of the Nightmare lifted just before Ursok's demise. Orchestrated by a courageous band of adventurers, after Xavius met his end, Ursok's spirit lingered within the renewed tranquility of the Emerald Dream. After the Nightmare Ordeal, Urzok's soul journeyed to Ardenweald in the Shadowlands, finding rest within a wild seed and turn a notch, awaiting rebirth. Aralon pledged to the Winter Queen to guard the Bear God's wild seed and nurture it with vital anima. As the anima drought cast its shadow over Ardenweald, Aralon struggled to find fresh anima. One day, returning from foraging, he stumbled upon members of the Wild Hunt sacrificing wild seeds in turn a notch to preserve the dwindling anima. Initially enraged and sprung into action to defend the grove he was tasked with protecting, 
until he was shown a vision by the Winter Queen revealing the imminent peril threatening all of Ardenweald. Faced with a heart-wrenching choice, he was asked to sacrifice one soul for the sake of the forest. Acknowledging Aralon's pure heart, the Winter Queen sympathetically allowed him to decide, understanding the gravity of the situation. One last time, you serve the wilds. You will not be forgotten. Seeking forgiveness, he drained the anima from Ursoc's wild seed, leaving it to crumble in the wind as a sacrifice to ensure the survival of the forest. Now we get to talk about Ursul, but I'll be kind of glossing over his beginning since him and Ursoc share the same start. They really only differ in Legion, but there is more to learn there, I feel, about what happened the day they died. Now when Ursul had been given his weapon, he took his training and weapon very seriously, mastering it over time. After falling in battle from being overrun by fell stalkers, he was able to go to the Emerald Dream with Ursoc to protect the dream. But over time, the Nightmare was able to manifest within the dream, which they were able to do due to Vordrasil's roots coming into contact with yogg Saron in his prison within Ulduar, which he used as a doorway to the Emerald Dream, due to Vordrasil's connection to the dream. The Old Gods spread small seeds of corruption throughout the dreamways. While yogg Saron opened the dream to his brethren, Nazoth would later become the one who took the most active role in its corruption. A chosen druid was tasked with retrieving the claws of Ursoc to help fight the legion that had returned. Knowing that those claws could turn the tide of the battle, the druid meets up with Leah Stonepaw to discuss where to find the claws as she is a member of the Druids of the Claw and dedicate their lives to following Ursoc's example. Upon meeting with her, she says that the claws were hidden away for a good reason and asks if the situation is truly so dire. After explaining the claws, you meet her in Grizzly Hills. Ursula observed the druid's courage and skill, ultimately bestowing his blessing upon them. Through these trials, you learn from Ursul that the two brothers were unstoppable together, but the day of the battle that ultimately claimed their lives. Ursok and I fought as a team. He would strike, and I would guard his side. Together, we were unstoppable. Tell me! Is there anyone willing to fight at your side, Druid? I've seen what this hero can do. I will gladly help. Once, during the chaos of an ancient battle, my brother and I became separated. I failed to be at his side when he needed me most. For this trial, you must prove that you can protect those who entrust you with their lives. Show me that you can succeed where I once failed. This one will be your charge. Guard her, or she will quickly be overwhelmed. Ursul forever carries that guilt, and forever wishes he could have saved his brother and not failed him. As the Emerald Nightmare ensnared Malorn in a chilling recreation of his demise by Archimonde, echoes of Ursoc and Ursul emerged. In this haunting reflection of the War of the Ancients, figments of the Bear God Brothers valiantly battled demons, leaving an indelible mark on the dreamy tapestry of Azeroth history. According to Murd and Bronzebeard in the book Exploring Azeroth Northrend, Howling Fjord can be aptly characterized as a region featuring green meadows intersected by bone-chilling rivers, pine forests wafted with a crisp and invigorating breeze, and towering rugged fjords. In the violent era of the Third War, Prince Arthas Menethil of Lordaeron embarked on a perilous mission to vanquish the Dreadlord Malganus for unleashing the plague of undeath that wreaked havoc across his homeland. Alongside the intrepid dwarven explorer Murd and Bronzebeard, whom they believed to be a mere pawn in the sinister game orchestrated by the Lich King. However, duty called Arthas back home when his father beckoned, yet the prince's unwavering resolve led him down a treacherous path. Faced with the dilemma of abandoning his pursuit or forsaking his duty, Arthas made a fateful decision. To ensure his men remained committed, he employed a cunning tactic, hiring mercenaries to set ablaze his own fleet, cunningly casting blame upon them for this apparent act of betrayal. In his relentless quest, Arthas ventured into the ominous dragon blight, where he uncovered the malevolent Frostmourne, a cursed blade with an insidious allure. The confrontation with Malganus ensued, resulting in a triumph for Arthas, but at an unimaginable cost, the forfeiture of his own soul to the insidious grasp of the Lich King. Haunted by his actions, Arthas descended into madness during a solitary trek through Northrend. Upon his return, a dark transformation unfolded as he mercilessly slaughtered his loyal followers. 
raising them from the dead as mindless scourge and some as ominous death knights. Meanwhile, the icy expanses of Dagger Cat Bay harbored secrets of their own, with Nerubians and ice trolls maintaining isolated outposts, unwitting witnesses to the unfolding saga of Arthas's expedition to the frigid lands of Northrend. The Lich King's awakening sent shockwaves through Northrend, rousing the ancient Vrykul from their long slumber. These towering beings returned to reclaim the forsaken keeps and villages that had been abandoned for millennia. As the Alliance, led by King Varian Rin, confronted by the Scourge threat, the Paladin Boulevard Four Dragon was tasked with eliminating the undead menace. The Valiant's expedition, upon arriving in Northrend, established a foothold in the Howling Fjord. Here, they faced the chilling reality of the Lich King's influence. Many Vrykul had succumbed to his control, launching relentless assaults on the Alliance's defenses until their numbers dwindled. The settlers of Valgard found themselves contending with reawakened Vrykul warriors, raiding from the ancient Utgard Keep. Meanwhile, Ironforge prospectors unearthed a mysterious race of Iron Dwarves, hinting at their own puzzling origins. Amidst this turmoil, the Forsaken established a presence, concocting a new plague to confront the Lich King. Vengeance Landing and New Agamond became their strongholds, paying homage to the famed Agamond family of Agamond Mills from Tyrus Fall Glades. Enter Prince Keliseth, a figure tied to the Vrykul's alliance, who took residence at Utgard Keep. He not only oversaw scourge operations in the Howling Fjord, but also proved to be a formidable adversary, collaborating with Igvar the Plunderer to orchestrate disruptive raids throughout the region. Now if you're like me and have no idea of the Agamond family, I figured we should talk about them. In the face of the Scourge's ominous arrival in Tyrus Fall, Gregor Agamond made a steadfast decision. His family would stand their ground and protect their homestead. The Agamonds, with unwavering determination, fortified their mills and rallied their employees to join the defense. Their once well-fortified stocked haven took a dark turn when the youngest son, Devlin, betrayed them by aligning with the Scourge. In a sinister act, Devlin murdered Watchmen and guided the undead through a breach, catching the defenders unaware as they slept. The ensuing chaos led to a third of the defenders falling before the undead were eventually quelled. With diminished numbers, the Agamon struggled to fend off the relentless Scourge assault. Tragically, the entire family succumbed to the plague of undeath, transforming into mindless Scourge undead. The Scourge, seeking to establish a base at the mills for attacks on the Forsaken, found a strategic foothold. Their local military leader, Captain Dargal, utilized necromancy in the Agamond family crypt, raising the ancestors to turn them against the Forsaken. The Death Guards, recognizing this threat, tasked brave adventurers with eradicating the Scourge in the mills. Simultaneously, Magistrate Severin commissioned heroes to confront the forces at the formidable family crypt. Amidst this turmoil, Coleman Farthing, a former Agamond employee, sought revenge by urging adventurers to bring the family's remains to him in Brill. The Agamond saga unfolds as a tale of betrayal, tragedy, and the lingering shadows of undeath, offering a gripping challenge for those willing to face the Scourge menace. Now with Howling Fjord having been the place the Vrykul woke up and call home for the most part, I figure a quick backstory on them is important. Renowned for their deep connection to the sea and the native proto-dragons of the region, these beings have a fascinating history. Originally, the Vrykul were titan-forged iron beings afflicted by the curse of flesh. Remarkably, they are the ancestors of the human race. The first humans emerged when Vrykul children were born weak and deformed due to the curse. In the era before the Great Sundering, King Yamaron led the Vrykul from Utgard Keep. Fearing the curse of flesh, he directed his people to enter a long hibernation to endure the coming millennia. However, not all Vrykul followed his path. Ages ago, a group ventured to the sacred realm of Stormheim in search of their true gods. Another seafaring faction settled on Kul Tiris, specifically in the region of Drustfar, becoming known as the Drust. With the onset of the Lich King's War in the icy wastelands, the Northrend Vrykul awoke, hailing him as a god of death. Under King Ymiron's leadership, they pledged themselves to the Lich King, joining the Scourge armies. After the living triumph and with no death god to serve, the Vrykul returned to their former way of life, keeping to themselves and resuming their unique existence. Utgard Keep, nestled among the central cliffs of Howling Fjord, was deemed an abandoned relic, a silent witness to a lost era. Yet a recent awakening has stirred the fortress's dormant residents, the Vrykul. 
Feared for their alleged alliance with the Scourge, these savage beings now terrorize neighboring settlements. With formidable proto-dragons under their command and unparalleled battle prowess, the Vrykul pose a direct threat to both Horde and Alliance endeavors in Northrend. The only conceivable means to break their indomitable spirit lies in defeating their revered leaders. However, failure in this quest may consign heroes to become trophies adorning the ancient halls of Utgard Fortress. The settlement of Valgard has recently rekindled the Vrykul's presence. Loyal to the dormant king Ymiron, rumors circulate that they serve the ominous Lich King. Their savage nature intertwines with the Titan creation myth unfolding as the expansion's events transpire. These fierce warriors launch assaults on Horde and Alliance settlements, pouring forth from the formidable Utgard Keep near Valgard. During the war against the Lich King, King Ymiron held his throne at Utgard Keep, forging an alliance with the Scourge. The Lich King dispatched Prince Kaelseth as an ambassador to oversee Scourge operations in Howling Fjord. Collaborating with Ingvar the Plunderer, they orchestrated disruptive raids, with adventurers eventually managing to defeat Prince Kaelseth, albeit temporarily. Ymiron's ultimate fate unfolded in a morbid twist, transformed into an undead entity. He met his demise at the hands of adventurers within the very pinnacle of his own keep. Utgard Keep stands as the Vrykul's central stronghold, reminiscent of the fell orc's Hellfire Citadel. Inside, the Dragonflare clan engineers mass war machines and trains proto-dragons to serve as steeds for their relentless raids. The ancient halls echo with the ominous legacy of a civilization reborn and a relentless quest for power. Now within Utgard Keep, you have four bosses to contend with. Prince Kaliseth, Skarvald, Dalron, and Ingvar the Plunderer. In the Scarlet Enclave, Kaliseth emerged in Acherus. Prince Valinar later directed fledgling Death Knights to find Kaliseth at the Crypt of Remembrance. There, he ordered the Death Knight to eliminate Quimby, the mayor of New Avalon, and retrieve the town registry. Further, he tasked the Death Knight with using torture tools to extract information about the Crimson Dawn from the Scarlet Crusade members, culminating in reporting to Orbaz Bloodbane at the Scarlet Tavern. The Lich King dispatched Kaliseth to Utgard Keep, seeking to harness the destructive potential of the Vrykul. Finding eager allies, he orchestrated scourge activities in the Howling Fjord. He served as the Lich King's eyes and ears, primarily residing in Utgard, where he collaborated with Ingvar the Plunderer to organize raids. Following the Forsaken's triumph over the Alliance's North Fleet in the Howling Fjord, Kaliseth appeared at Vengeance Landing with Dragonflare of Rykul. He taunted High Executor Anselm, inviting the Forsaken to rejoin the Scourge. Displaying magical prowess, Kaliseth outsmarted Anselm's archers, draining the souls of their troops before vanishing. Anselm then tasked adventures with defeating Kaliseth inside Utgard Keep, where the Blood Prince met his demise during the assault. In the chilling realm of Icecrown Citadel, Kaliseth, along with his brother Valinar and Prince Taldurum, was resurrected by the Lich King to form the Blood Prince Council. Their mission was to avenge their defeat and to protect Blood Queen Lanathel. Despite the renewed undeath, the Blood Princes were once again defeated in their quest for revenge. In the curious traditions of the Vrykul, there's a fascinating practice of uniting unlikely allies. Some believe it's to blend diverse skills for a stronger force, while others suggest it's purely for King Ymiron's entertainment. Enter Scarvald and Dalron. A living testament to this custom. With the mighty strength of a Vrykul and the mystical arts of a human necromancer, they form a duo ready to dish out punishment to anyone daring to interfere with the Scourge. It's a unique partnership born from tradition, where brawn and magic unite for a common, formidable purpose. Ingvar the Plunderer, the ultimate challenge at Utgard Keep. Perched on the balcony overlooking Daggercat Bay's waterfall, he orchestrates relentless attacks on Valgard. Under his command, Dragon Riders soar above, mercilessly slaughtering enemies without warning. Ingvar is famed for his sheer brute strength, compensating for his seemingly dull acts by relying on raw power to cleave through foes up close. Serving as his herald is Yannis the Mystic, bringing him back to life for one last chance to take you down for the Lich King. After finishing off Ingvar, you have Utgard Pinnacle, which is the second part of the keep you can take on, and you can fight four more bosses, Svala Sorograve, Gortok Palehoof, Scotty the Ruthless, and King Ymiron. Valkyr. A fascinating breed of ascended female Vrykul hold a unique place in the realms beyond. The first of their kind were warriors of the light, purposefully crafted to fulfill the duty assigned by the prime designate, Odin. 
Their noble task involves ushering the spirits of the illustrious departed to the Halls of Valor, a sacred calling that adds a touch of the divine to the perplexing world they inhabit. In the ranks of Ingvar the Plunderer, Svala stood out as his trusted lieutenant, fearlessly leading daring scouting missions into Horde and Alliance outposts. Her sharp instincts unearthed the enemy's impending invasion plans on Utgard, granting the Lich King precious time to ready his forces. In recognition of her unwavering service, he bestowed upon her a transformative gift. Svala emerged as a Valkyr, a revered warrior maiden of the Scourge, forever bound to the dark legacy of her newfound status. Utgard Keep holds a trove of Reichel trophies, and standing prominently among them is the formidable Gortok. Frozen in a perpetual display of might, King Ymiron showcases this magnetar's brutal visage as a stark reminder. Even the wildest creatures serve as mere adornments in Vrykul halls. However, beneath the icy exterior lies a living statue with the potential to wreak havoc if set free, unleashing its indiscriminate wrath upon any who dare cross its path. The Frozen Guardian, once a mere decoration, harbors the power to sow destruction when unshackled. Among the Vrykul, nicknames are badges of honor tied to achievements. Actions like purifying a Drakari bloodline or beheading Tonka might earn one the title of Dutiful, yet it requires a dark deed to be dubbed Ruthless. Skadi, a figure with a notorious past, earned his moniker through relentless pursuits. His grim task involved hunting down Vrykul who dared to shelter the malformed infants. The ancestors of humanity, condemned by the stern judgment of Ymiron, in the intricate tapestry of Vrykul lore, Skadi's ruthless pursuit etched a dark legacy for himself. King Ymiron, once the revered leader of the Vrykul during the era of Titan-forged iron, steered his people through triumph and tragedy before the fateful sundering. Under his command, the Dragonflare clan achieved victory against their adversaries, driving the Yalgar into Kalimdor's lush central forest in a coordinated offensive. However, this triumph was overshadowed by the insidious Curse of Flesh. The curse unfolded, transforming the sturdy metal Vrykul into flesh and blood. Ymiron grappled with the anguish of this transformation, laid blame on the Titans, and sought to purge what he deemed as weakness from his people. Soon, Dragonflare women birthed small, malformed children, sparking fear and superstition. Ymiron, torn between blame for the affliction, accused the mythical Keepers, urging his people to forsake them and unite under his banner. A moral dilemma emerged among the Vrykul as some advocated for the extermination of these aberrations to preserve the purity of the Vrykul race. Others pleaded for mercy, recognizing that despite their weakness, these infants were still their children. In deep contemplation, the king reached a perilous conclusion, blaming the Titans for the curse. The Vrykul, believing this false narrative, abandoned their gods and outlawed Titan worship at Ymiron's command. The king sided with those calling for the death of the malformed infants, making the decree that parents must kill their afflicted children or face execution at Yalarbron. While many obeyed this harsh command, some, unable to comply, departed from the dragon flare with their children. Thus, the king unwittingly played a role in the creation of what would become the human race. Faced with the persistent curse, Ymiron chose an extraordinary solution, putting his people into magical slumber to be awakened ages later. Ymiron himself entered this enchanted sleep, alongside elite Vrykul warriors, awaiting a future awakening shrouded in mystery. In the icy battleground of Icecrown, Vrykul clashed in the pit of Valhallas. The victors ascended to be the Emerjar, an elite warrior rank crafted by King Ymiron in service of the Lich King. The defeated, however, faced a grim fate, transforming into Vargul, undead creatures bound to servitude. Amidst the war, Queen Angerboda, Ymiron's wife, sought to awaken him beneath Yalarbron as the Lich King's influence spread across Northrend. Their intent was to serve Vrykul's newfound death god together. Although adventurers thwarted Angerboda's plan, the Lich King intervened, transporting Ymiron to Utgard Pinnacle. Proving his worth, Ymiron was made undead, leading the Scourge allied Vrykul against the Horden Alliance from his throne in Utgard Keep. As adventurers stormed the Keep, the Vrykul King met his end at Ymiron's seat, making a defiant last stand. In the aftermath, Ymiron found himself being dragged down to Helheim, marking the end of his life among the living, but his story wasn't finished just yet. The Fallen King stood on the cusp of the Halls of Valor in the afterlife, a place reserved for the mighty. However, his insatiable thirst for power lured him into a dark pact with the Lich King, sealing the fate of his people with a curse. 
In the wake of his demise, the once open gates of the Eternal Halls remained shut to him. Instead, the damned king found himself on the desolate shores of the Maw of Souls, bound in service to Helia. Amidst the third invasion by the Burning Legion, Odin's mortal champion, the Battle Lord, led an assault on the Maw of Souls, bringing Ymiron to his knees. Recognizing an opportunity for poetic justice, the warrior convinced Odin that forcing Ymiron into his eternal service would serve as a fitting punishment. Thus, Ymiron's destiny took a twist as he was ushered into the Halls of Valor to serve Odin for all eternity. Now, within Howling Fjord, each faction has two major settlements. Each of them has a decent backstory, so I decided to throw all of them in there. First, let's start with the Hordes, which consists of New Agamond and Vengeance Landing. Then the Alliance is Valagard and Westgard Keep, boasting a distinct architectural style that is as dark and gothic as it is spindly. It stands as a stark departure from the ruins that typically mark Forsaken controlled territories, a manifestation of their identity in the face of decay. In the throes of the war against the Lich King, New Agamond emerged as a battleground, a front line where the Forsaken fiercely combated the Scourge. Under Sylvanas Windrunner's leadership, the Royal Apothecary Society in Undercity delved into the sinister realm of concocting a new plague, designed to eradicate the relentless Scourge menace. After years of clandestine research, the Forsaken were poised to unleash their ultimate weapon upon Arthas's forces, conducting a chilling test at New Agamond. The once vibrant surroundings of the town succumbed to a ghastly transformation, leaving the land barren and brown amidst the otherwise lush landscape. Later on, reports from the Bronzebeard Brothers revealed a lingering presence in New Agamond. Despite the challenges faced, the Forsaken tenaciously maintained control over the town, an enduring symbol of their resilience in the face of adversity. The echoes of war may have faded, but New Agamond stands as a silent testament to the enduring spirits of the Forsaken. Nestled in the rugged northeast of Dagger Cap Bay in Utgard Keep, Vengeance Landing stands stoically as the military outpost for the Hand of Vengeance in a Howling Fjord. This forsaken bastion, meticulously crafted and overseen by the indomitable Sylvanas Windrunner, serves as the Horde's vital gateway into eastern Northrend. With its own docks welcoming ships from Tyr's Fall Glades and a Zeppelin Tower facilitating connections between the Undercity, Vengeance Landing is the Horde's strategic foothold in the chilling expanse. The town's eerie visage, tainted by a sickly yellow hue that lingers over the surrounding vale, sets it apart even from a distance. However, the town faced an unexpected challenge when the Alliance orchestrated a daring ambush, establishing a camp just beyond its walls. The Horde soldiers found themselves thwarted by cannons strategically placed atop the fortifications. In a bid to turn the tide, an intrepid adventurer dispatched by a bat ventured to the besieged navy offshore. Collaborating with sailors under duress from the same ambush, they cleared the ship decks allowing support guns to unleash a barrage against the enemy. Returning to solid ground, the adventurer played a crucial role in the conflict by launching flares aiding in the targeting of naval guns against the Alliance defenses. Reports from the ever-vigilant Bronzebeard brothers affirm that Vengeance Landing remains a resilient and active military outpost, a testament to the enduring strength of the Forsaken forces in Howling Fjord. Perched proudly on the western cliffs of the Howling Fjord, Westgard Keep stands as a bastion with a diverse population, housing both humans and dwarves akin to Valgard. The Keep's heart is adorned with a striking dwarven statue, a testament to its unique character. In the era of the war against the Lich King, Westgard Keep served as the aerial gateway to Northrend. A daring attempt to supply Winterguard Keep via flying machines ended in a clash with the icy menace of Frostworms, testament to the challenges faced. Additionally, the Keep played a generous hand by assisting the Explorers League at Steelgate, showcasing its collaborative spirit. Anchored within its confines was the commandeered Goblin Zeppelin, the Lady Lug, adding an air of intrigue to the locale. The Keep Saga continued during the trial of Garrosh Hellscream on Pandaria, where it faced an assault from the True Horde. The objective? To liberate the Goblin Harrowmiser and commandeer the Lady Lug for their cause. The Bronzebeard brothers made their way to Westgard Keep. However, the local commander had little to report, aside from the Vrykul maintaining their distance and the Tuskar diligently supplying the Keep with a bounty of fresh fish. The Keep, with its storied past, stood resilient against the ebb and flow of time a unique tapestry woven with the threads of alliance, trials, and encounters with the unknown. Valgard emerged as the initial haven for the fortunate souls who endured the treachery orchestrated by Arthas. A humble beginning, it sprouted as a modest settlement nestled along the shores of Dagger Cat Bay, boasting a reliable anchorage for those seeking solace in the aftermath of betrayal. 
As the Valiant Expedition stepped into the scene at the onset of the war against the Lich King, Valgar transformed from a quaint settlement into a bustling town. Nestled on the opposite bank of the river from Wormskull Village in Utgard Keep, the construction initially enjoyed the advantage of the dormant Vrykul, making navigation a breeze. Vice Admiral Keller took the helm of Valgard in its infancy, back when it was a quiet and unassuming hamlet. The tranquility, however, was short-lived. A month later, the awakening of Vrykul ushered in a new era marked by sporadic assaults. Dragonflayer Vrykul and their formidable war companions, along with the proto-dragon riders, descended upon Valgard, unleashing chaos from both land and sky. Vice Admiral Keller vividly recounted, We'd been here a month when those malformed giants appeared out of thin air. In the midst of these challenges, even the esteemed Marshal Gryan Stoutmantle found a temporary abode in Valgard. Despite the turbulence, the Alliance's icebreaker, the North Spear, established a reliable link between Menethil Harbor and the wetlands and Valgard, ensuring a seamless connection akin to Gnomish clockwork. The once sleepy town had evolved into a dynamic hub, navigating the ebb and flow of an ever-changing landscape. The Bronzebeard brothers made a pit stop at the town. Seeking respite, they indulged in a few pints at the local inn, where they uncovered a shift in the town's priorities. The remaining soldiers had pivoted towards exploration and diplomacy. However, the tranquility was tempered by the persistent threat looming from nearby Wormskull Village. Despite the newfound focus on diplomacy, the stout walls of Valgard continued to bear the brunt of regular Vrykul attacks, adding an ongoing layer of challenge to the town's post-war landscape. During the war against the Lich King, the Howling Fjord harbored a dark secret. Doors from the Explorers League ventured into the chilling abyss, driven by curiosity. Those who lingered to explore unearthed Saronite, the crystallized black blood of the malevolent yogg saron The ore whispered sinister secrets, casting a maddening spell upon those who dared to delve too deep. The afflicted dwarves, driven to insanity by the Saronite's influence, left with the majority of their mules and equipment. Explorer Abigail, determined to reclaim the lost resources, dispatched Alliance adventurers on a daring mission to retrieve them. Sapper Sterling, initially captivated by the allure of ore and gems from the Gulch, swiftly shifted his focus to gems alone upon hearing the warnings of the ore's malevolence. Within the Gulch, the maddened explorers, led by the unfortunate Squeg Idol Hunter, found themselves in the crosshairs of Westgard Keep. Meanwhile, a forsaken caravan passing through the area fell victim to the erratic onslaughts of the deranged dwarves. Apothecary Malthus suspected the influence of beer in their descent into madness and demanded a sample for further examination. The Forsaken, not once to shy away, dispatched horde adventurers to quell the madness in the gulch and collect the brains of the afflicted dwarves. In the chaotic aftermath, the gulch became a battleground of conflicting interests. The Bronzebeard brothers ventured to this haunted locale. To their dismay, Bran recognized some of the gibbering madmen as former members of the League, a revelation that stirred deep unease within him. The echoes of the Saronite's malevolence lingered, leaving scars on both the land and the mind of those who dared to uncover its secrets. Nestled amidst the towering mountains of the Howling Fjord, Shalabron stands as a formidable Vrykul fortress. Here, amidst the chilling winds, a sinister collaboration unfolds between the Vrykul and the Scourge. Together they engage in mysterious rituals, rousing ancient Vrykul from their deep slumber, and ominously transforming fallen warriors into undead minions. The mysterious walking halls lie concealed behind an entrance on the lower tier, shrouded in the shadows of secrecy. Meanwhile, the Winter's Terrace commands attention at the heart of the main structure, where the echoes of eerie rites reverberate through the icy air. Intriguingly, a clandestine passage is quietly burrowing its way from the depths beneath Utgard Keep, leading to the cryptic depths of Shalerbron. Dagger Cat Bay, nestled in the heart of the Howling Fjord, is a geographical marvel. Encircled by Valgar, Wormskull Village, Utgard Keep, the Falls of Ymiron, Niflvar, and Ghostblade Post in a clockwise dance, the bay's exclusive inhabitants include the residents of Valgar and the enigmatic Freikul from nearby settlements. On the bay's western shore, Valgard stands proudly, while the harpooning Niflvar perches on the cliffs to the east. The lifeblood of the bay flows from Lake Caldrus through the majestic falls of Ymiron, with the iconic Utgard Keep poised on the tranquil lake surface. Beneath the frozen surface of Daggercap Bay, hammerhead sharks known as Daggercap Hammerheads glide through the icy waters, adding an intriguing dimension to the bay's frozen tableau. 
The intricate interplay of settlements, natural wonders, and aquatic inhabitants paints Dagger Cat Bay as a captivating centerpiece in the vibrant tapestry of the Howling Fjord. Now there is a little retcon with Dagger Cat Bay. This was originally a place where Arthas had made landfall in his pursuit of Melganus, as was shown in Warcraft 3. But it was later retconned to have been in the Dragon Blight at the Forgotten Shore. Chronicle later stated that Arthas made landfall in the Howling Fjord. Then again later in exploring Azeroth, Arthas' landing place was in the Forgotten Shore in Dragonblight. Nestled amidst the desolate embrace of Ice Crown lies a realm shrouded in perpetual darkness and bone-chilling cold. Where the once pristine glaciers have succumbed to a sinister corruption, rendering the ice itself a foreboding shade of black. Sauronite structures weave through the landscape, forming ominous walls, gates, and towering walkways that link the strongholds of the Scourge. Ice Crown is an anchor that holds Azeroth to the Shadowlands, as is mentioned by Blonsomdi in the quest Jailer of the Damned. Section 1 History Ice Crown's sinister notoriety was brought about by Kil Jaden, who cast the Lich King Nerzul back into the mortal realm. The prison's collision with the glacier brought forth the ominous Frozen Throne, its impact seen as far as the Grizzly Hills. Within this icy seat of power, Nerzul set in motion the chilling birth of the Scourge orchestrating the corruption of the world to serve the impending Burning Legion onslaught. But the thing the Legion didn't know is that Nerzul was planning his revenge. From the Frozen Throne, the Lich King was trapped within, fueled by his determination to exact revenge on those who had wronged him over the years of being tortured and broken down. He grew in power under the watchful eyes of the Dreadlords, without them realizing his power was growing. Thanks to his psychic powers, Nerzul mastered necromancy and developed a plague that would ultimately lead Arthas to become the new Lich King and conquer much of Northrend from his throne. Along with that, Nerzul is able to have the Scourge and Dreadlords build the Citadel we know today. Together, they plan to combat the Legion using the undead Scourge and purge Azeroth of the living, as they believed it was the only way to defeat the Burning Legion. In the aftermath of the Third War, the Scarlet Crusade and a daring counter-offensive approached Icecrown Citadel, yet their valiant efforts were met with ferocious resistance from the relentless Scourge. The casualties among the Scarlet Crusade's high-ranking officers, including Grand Admiral Baron Westwind and Captain General Orman of Stromgard, stand as haunting testaments to the icy fortress's formidable defenses. Section 2 Wrath of the Lich King When the Alliance and Horde get involved with the battle against the Lich King, Icecrown had been scarred by the tremendous force unleashed when Arthas and the Lich King became one single being. The Scourge, with meticulous intent, fortified the desolate landscape, erecting colossal walls and formidable ramparts that now snake their way through the region. An imposing sentinel, Angrathar the Wrathgate, stands as a formidable barrier, warding off entry from the neighboring Dragon Blight. Dominating the horizon, the reborn Ice Crown Citadel casts its ominous shadow, a testament to the Scourge's relentless determination. The glacier itself, a heart of darkness, is shielded by three imposing gates. Mordrathar, Aldrathar, and Corprathar, each a grim guardian against the intrusion of the uninitiated. Section 3 Aftermath After Arthas met his demise, the haunting expanse of Ice Crown was occupied with both Horde and Alliance forces navigating its icy corridors for weeks. A peculiar calm settled over the once tumultuous region, a respite earned by the firm grip of Bolvar Fordragon, who, wielding the Helm of Domination, held sway over the dormant Scourge forces, casting a tranquil hush over the frigid domain for years. Section 4 Shadowlands In a seismic turn of events, Sylvanas Windrunner shattered the Helm of Domination, tearing the very fabric of the sky over Ice Crown. This rupture served as an otherworldly gateway, connecting Azeroth to the mysterious Shadowlands. From the ominous Maw guided by Harold Delora, the relentless Maw Swarm descended upon Ice Crown wrestling control of the Scourge and the cult of the damned entrenched in the region. They orchestrated the resurrection of fallen Scourge champions, remnants of the brutal war against the Lich King. Faced with this existential threat, the Argent Crusade, along with the unlikeliest of alliances between Horde and Alliance, rallied once more. Their collective might was unleashed to defend the sacred Argent Coliseum, where a climactic battle unfolded against the resurrected champion strewn across the icy expanse of Ice Crown. With the menace quelled, a united horde and alliance turned their gaze to the Frozen Throne. Embarking on a perilous journey into the heart of the Maw, the fate of Azeroth hung in the balance as they ventured into the unknown depths, determined to confront the mysteries that lurked beyond the Frozen Throne's icy facade. 
Now I also wanted to go over some locations that I find interesting within Ice Crown. The first location is Ice Crown Citadel. The imposing Ice Crown Citadel, a monolith of the Northrend landscape, houses the world's largest undead army. Within its chilling walls reside the Lich King, a being with near divine power over his inexhaustible, seemingly limitless minions, and the determination to bring Azeroth to ruin. A campaign against this formidable fortress is one of the most perilous ventures in Azeroth's history, and the most crucial. The renowned champions, High Lord Tyrion Forgering of the Argent Crusade, and High Lord Darien Mograine had united to spearhead the assault on Ice Crown's fortified barriers. Both the Horde and Alliance have paid a heavy price in lives, entire battalions in fact. Failure is not an option. The Lich King's rule must be terminated. In the climactic attack on the Citadel, it was the Argent Crusade who breached its barriers. They made great sacrifices, without hesitation, to witness the fall of the Lich King. Now I'm also going to be working on a specific video about Ice Crown Citadel, because there really wasn't much on the lore of the Citadel, minus that it was built by the Dreadlords and the Scourge, and that the Lich King resides in there. So I'm going to work on a special video just for Ice Crown, but it'll be a hot minute before it comes out. It's going to be a little different than the other stuff, but hopefully you will enjoy it when I eventually get it out there. We now travel northeast to Syndragosa's Fall. In the War of the Ancients, the Blue Dragonflight suffered a catastrophic loss. Many dragons plummeted to the earth, their bodies becoming entombed in what would later be known as the Ice Crown Glacier. Among the fallen was Syndragosa, the beloved consort of Maligos, who perished in her desperate attempt to reach the Dragonblight the sacred final resting place of dragons. Centuries later, Arthas Menethil, the Lich King, stirred from his prolonged slumber and ventured to the site of Syndragosa's fall. There, he resurrected Syndragosa from her icy grave, transforming her into a formidable skeletal frost worm and commanding her to lead the frost brood into battle. In a cruel twist of fate, the Lich King reanimated the spirits of Syndragosa's lost offspring in front of her skeletal form a final insult to the once mighty dragon. As the war against the Lich King raged on, the area became infested with acolytes and members of the Cult of the Damned, who were busy raising more frostworms from the ice. The Frostbrood became the focus of quests here, with adventurers dispatched by Thessarion or Coltira Deathweaver to eradicate the cultist's presence. During their mission, they crossed paths with Matthias Laner who offered them a chilling vision of the Lich King resurrecting Syndragosa in exchange for whelp bone dust. We continue on north to the Argent Tournament Grounds. In the battle against the Lich King, the Argent Crusade declared the commencement of the Argent Tournament. This event aimed not only to instill a sense of unity among the constantly divided Horden Alliance, but also to prepare a vast army for a strike on the Lich King's stronghold. More crucially, it was to identify the most skilled warriors who would then form a compact strike team to spearhead the invasion into Ice Crown Citadel. The strategy of deploying a small team for the initial attack was based on the understanding that any significant loss of life would only strengthen the Scourge, potentially leaving the rest of the world vulnerable to assault. The tournament also served as an opportunity to mend scars from the catastrophe at Angrathar the Wrathgate, although it was arguably too early for such healing. Despite facing criticism, both King Varian Wren and War Chief Thrall, each accompanied by Jaina Proudmoore and Garrosh Hellscream respectively, made their presence known at these events, and agreed to witness some of the tournament's challenges in the Crusaders' Coliseum. The Silver Covenant in the Silver Covenant Pavilion, and the Sun Reavers in the Sun Reaver Pavilion, represented both factions during the Argent Tournament. Argent Peacekeepers kept a watchful eye over the grounds, ensuring no conflict arose between the Horde and Alliance. Nonetheless, the tournament caught the Lich King's attention, who dispatched forces to cause disruptions in various ways, including assaults and abductions by the Cult of the Damned, the Black Knight's infiltration of the tournament, and attacks by Valkyr, partly in an effort to liberate some of their captured comrades, though they failed to cause any permanent harm. Near the end of the trial of the Crusader, the Lich King himself made an appearance in the Colosseum, reminding those present of the vast reach of the Nerubian Empire across and beneath the entire continent, before shattering the tournament ground's floor, plunging the Crusade's champions into a network of underground tunnels to face a resurrected Anu Barak. Despite the surprise attack, Anu Barak was defeated, marking the end of the Argent Tournament and the commencement of the assault on Ice Crown Citadel. During the events of Shadowlands, amid the Scourge's revival, the tournament grounds were subjected to a focused assault by the Scourge, 
transforming into the Crusade's primary operational base in the battle against the undead. The onslaught was as abrupt as it was unforeseen, leading many Valiants injured while the civilians did their best to defend the area. As a result, Justicar Mariel Trueheart called for reinforcements from the Crusade's forces in the Eastern Kingdoms and Kalimdor. With the assistance of adventurers, they succeeded in pushing back the undead and saving numerous wounded lives. Finally, we venture to the west to the Shadow Vault. In the battle against the Lich King, the Shadow Vault was initially under the control of the Scourge. However, adventurers, dispatched by either Thessarion from the Skybreaker or Kultira Deathweaver from the Orgrim's Hammer, those are the airborne warships patrolling the skies of Icecrown, collaborated with the Knights of the Ebon Blade to seize it as a stronghold. Following the capture of the Shadow Vault, the Scourge persistently launched attacks on it. While the Death Knights utilized it as a command center, given its beneficial strategic location for assaulting the Vrykul of Jotunheim. Once secured, the Shadow Vault was equipped with all the conveniences of an inn, a host, vendors for general merchandise, trade goods, and provisions. It also housed rune forges for Death Knights, a flight route, and the supply officer for the Knights of the Ebon Blade. Sometime after the Lich King's fall, the orc warrior Kingslayer Orcus brought a frostworm named Kasha to the vault where the Knights of the Ebon Blade nursed her back to health, which she then served as his mount. The Horde do a quest chain with Orcus where you help him throughout Hillsbrad foothills, but at the end of it he ends up dying due to his injuries taken throughout the battle, and you can see him as a ghost riding on top of his trusted steed Kasha, but you can only see him when you are a ghost as well. After Sylvanas broke the Helm of Domination, the Ebon Blade temporarily lost control of their base when the Scourge attacked and caught them by surprise. In the attempt to reclaim their base back, Duke Lenkrall called upon the champions of the Alliance and the Horde to get the base back under the Ebon Blade's control, and were able to eventually retake it. Today I want to talk about Sholazar Basin, but before we dive into the talk, at the end I go into a rant about some confusion I have when I was actually looking into this. So if you want to hear that, stick around till the end. There will be timestamps if you want to check it out as well. And one more thing, if you aren't subscribed and you enjoy this sort of content, maybe consider subscribing and liking, it would help me out. Either way, let's get into it. Nestled within Northrend's icy grasp, Sholazar Basin emerges as a vibrant haven, a tropical jungle sanctuary shaped by Freya and protected by colossal pylons standing sentinel against the encroaching scourge, crafted by the mighty titans themselves. Venturing into Shalazar Basin, intrepid adventurers become embroiled in a factional skirmish, witnessing the rivalry between the Wolvar Frenzyheart tribe and the Icy Gorlocks, distant kin to the notorious Morlocks. United under the banner of the Oracles, these differing Gorlock tribes add complexity to the jungle's intrigue. Adventurers find themselves at a crossroads, compelled to align with either faction, but while you have to pick one to side with, you are allowed to easily change to whichever faction you wish to be aligned with. Now let's talk about the history. While the Titans shaped Azeroth, Freya took special interest in designing Shulazar Basin, this verdant land akin to Ungoro Crater and the Vale of Eternal Blossoms, which Freya also designed, stood as an experimental land, an area where the potent energies of Will of Eternity harmonized. These sanctuaries birthed the awe-inspiring wild gods, entities whose majestic forms and untamed spirits were sculpted in the crucible of these converging points of cosmic power. Freya's design manifested not just a landscape, but an intricate dance of life. Now I want to explore a few areas. Let's start with the Lost Lands. The pillars which hold back the Scourge from entering the basin, the Sun-Touched, Moss Light, Sky Reach, and Glimmering Pillar, all stand strong and ready to hold back the Scourge. But one does not. It fell during the Lich King's reign, the Lifeblood Pillar. With the fall of this pillar, the Scourge broke through, causing this blighted canvas to stain among the lush greenery that is Sholazar Basin. While the remaining pillars hold back the Scourge from advancing, they have taken over what is now called the Lost Lands. In the throes of the war against the Lich King, the nefarious Cult of the Damned orchestrated the demise of the once majestic Lifeblood Pillar. Its sabotage gave birth to the Avalanche, a cascade of Ice Crown's frigid snows, breaching the basin's defenses and granting the Scourge an ominous foothold. Amidst this grim picture, the remnants of Mosswalker Village linger as spectral echoes, its Gorlock denizens long gone either fleeing the encroaching darkness or succumbing to its malevolent grasp. A fractured relic of the lifeblood pillar lies asunder, its once potent machinery now a testament to the ruthless incision made by the Scourge in their quest for the Red Crystal Heart. In this dismal theater of decay, the valiant avatar of Freya stands determined, a guardian against the encroaching blight. Her plea for aid echoes through the desolation, as adventurers join the dance against the relentless tide of the Scourge, 
striving to mend the wounded heart of the land. After the war against the Jailer, hope flickers dimly in the Lost Lands. The Bronzebeard brothers encounter the Avatar of Freya, who whisper tales of slow recovery. The undead sentinels, once driven by the Lich King's dark command, now wander aimlessly. Their purpose fractured in the aftermath of a conflict that reshaped the very fabric of existence. Now I want to discuss the two factions, the Wolvar and the Oracles. First we begin with the Frenzyheart tribe, the Wolvar. In the heart of Sholazar Basin, a primal saga unfolds with the Frenzyheart tribe, a tenacious band of Wolvars. Thrust into this jungle sanctuary by the relentless march of the Scourge during the prelude to the Lich King's War. Nomads displaced from their ancestral lands, these Wolvars found an unlikely refuge in Sholazar Basin, determined to carve out a new home amidst the lush chaos. According to Muradin Bronzebeard, the Wolvars are unsure where their original lands were, but all that is truly known is that this is their home now, and they will fight to protect it. Despite their outward calmness, the Frenzy Heart's primal instincts clash fiercely with the Gorlock tribes, collectively known as the Oracles. This clash of civilizations adds a vibrant layer to the jungle's complex ecosystems, where alliances are as elusive as the shifting winds. To tread the path of the Frenzy Heart, adventurers embark on an odyssey, a quest chain commencing with playing along and culminating in the weighty A Hero's Burden. The choice between slaying Gorlocks or Wolvars becomes a pivotal moment, a fork in the road determining one's allegiance. Yet in this dynamic realm, choices aren't set in stone. This encounter can be revisited, a daily dance of shifting loyalties. Following the Jailer's War, the inquisitive Bronzebeard brothers ventured to Frenzyheart Hill. Astonishingly, the Wolvars greeted Bran as a prodigal ally, an unexpected reunion marked by camaraderie and jests. Around the crackling fire, they shared tales over a feast of roast crocolisk, illuminating a chapter where the complexities of friendship transcended even the boundaries of their own sworn rivalry with the Oracles. Now let's talk about the Oracles. In the heart of Sholazar Basin, the enigmatic oracles emerge as more than just a faction. They see themselves as the guardians of Titan mysteries, navigating the intricate dance between guardianship and the nebulous understanding of the artifacts that grace their jungle sanctuary. Entwined in a territorial ballet with the Wolvar Frenzy Heart tribe, the oracles navigate the complexity of a war fueled not only by rivalry, but by the echoes of a shared social tapestry. While sworn foes of the Wolvar, the oracles mirror their adversaries in social structure, where warriors toil in the trenches, while the true cultural compass is held by formidable shamanic leaders, often bearing the revered title denoted by the word Sioux, spelled S-O-O. -O. In the shadow of the Lich King's War, adventurers embark on a narrative journey, ushered into the oracles' realm through the entrancing quest initiated by the part-time hunter. A delicate dance unfolds as allegiances shift from the frenzy heart to the oracles, a pivotal choice crystallizing the quest a hero's burden. At the end of the events of Shadowlands, the Bronzebeard brothers graced the Rainspeaker canopy, greeted with the warmth akin to the Frenzy Heart's reception in their village. The diplomatic finesse of Bran Bronzebeard transcended rivalries. As the Oracles, intrigued by the Titan's kin, hailed Magni Bronzebeard as Thragar, a cryptic term resonating with the Titan origins. In the solemn acknowledgement of Azeroth's voice, the Oracle's obsession with safeguarding Titan technology found a harmonious echo, weaving a tale where diplomacy and ancient mysteries converged in the verdant embrace of Sholazar's enigmatic basin. Now I figured I should at least mention where each of the factions live in the basin, and each will be rather short, but good to know I think. Let us start with the Wolvar, where they live at Frenzyheart Hill. Perched atop Frenzyheart Hill, the quaint village of the Wolvar Frenzyheart tribe stands proudly. These Wolvar, once displaced by the Scourge, crafted their distinctive low round dwellings as a resilient testament to their survival. Now we must talk about the Oracles. They reside in Rainspeaker Canopy. Nestled northeast of River's Heart, Rainspeaker Canopy emerges as a haven for the mystical Oracles. Their quaint abodes perch atop stilts, inviting gentle zephyrs through open sides, adorned with leafy thatches warding off the whims of rain. The air resonates with the melodic charm of wind chimes crafted by the Oracles adorned with crystalline fragments echoing the secrets whispered by the pillars of the village. Now we move over to River's Heart. Within the heart of Sholazar Basin, River's Heart unveils a captivating picture of natural wonders. This small lake, cradled beneath the sea level and encircled by imposing cliffs, serves as a convergence point for all four rivers in the region. The dramatic meeting of these waterways culminates in cascading waterfalls that breathe life into the basin. On the northeastern shore, Lakeside Landing graces the lake's edge. A charming retreat surrounded by trees that hint at the lake's deeper past. 
Yet beneath the tranquil surface lurks a secret, a horde of stranded threshers, swept in by the rivers that merge into this aquatic sanctuary. Lakeside Landing isn't merely a scenic spot, it's a hub of activity here. Here, Pilot Vic, a cold weather flying trainer, shares the skies with Marvin Wobblesprocket, the ever reliable flight master. And also, there is Tamara Wobblesprocket, a quest giver and Marvin's presumed wife. As the waters ebb and flow, the destination of their journey remains one that no one knows the answer to. Murden Bronzebeard muses on the lake's destiny, labeling it a puzzle and a mystery. Bran, ever the explorer, dismisses the conventional, proposing a magic-laden narrative. Meanwhile, Magni suggests the Hand of the Titans, insinuating a purposeful design to this watery tapestry, an unsolved riddle awaiting discovery. We head now to Maker's Perch. Nestled in the northwest reaches of Sholazar Basin, the Maker's Perch stands as a testament to the Titans' architectural skills. This celestial facility, strategically positioned as a vantage point, served as the Overseer's watchtower for their magnificent creations. Within its halls, a silent symphony of Titan constructs remains, dutiful guardians of an empty expanse. In contrast to its grander counterpart, the Maker's Overlook, this perch carries a subtle charm. Its entrance, discreetly carved into the mountain wall, conceals the marvels within. Resting gracefully on the basin floor, the relatively concise hall unfolds to unveil a spectacle through towering arched windows that frame a mesmerizing view of the sea. Brand Bronzebeard tells a story of a gnome venturing into the sea with a submarine, yet she couldn't find the windows. Amidst the stoic constructs and the echoes of the Titan's legacy, this lesser-known abode whispers its own story, a subtle chapter in the Cosmic Chronicle. Now we head over to look at the Maker's Overlook. Perched majestically in the eastern expanse of Sholazar Basin, the Maker's Overlook defies gravity, a titan's marvel soaring high above the rugged mountains. The celestial structure, seemingly born from the very heights it occupies, boasts a grand entrance beckoning adventures into its mysterious depths. Beyond its entrance lies a labyrinth of halls, intricately carved into the mountain's core, revealing glimpses of colossal, rune-inscribed gears, mechanical behemoths turning with deliberate grace in a mysterious machine. The purpose of this mechanical marvel remains veiled in uncertainty, a titan secret etched into the heart of Shulazar's northeast mountainside. Accessible only by flight, the overlook unfolds as a celestial perch, offering an unparalleled vantage point to survey the basin below. It is here that the titans orchestrated their creations, an elevated realm where cosmic design met earthly manifestation. Venturing inside amidst the rhythmic hum of clockwork gears, echoes of other titan constructs resonate. The ambience mirrors the mystique of Loken's bargain, the oldest, and the majesty of the Engine of the Makers. A clandestine teleporter, which I couldn't actually find to take me there, concealed within the Overlook, opens a portal to the Hall of Communion, a sprawling, ornate expanse that reverberates with emptiness, echoing the whispers of a bygone era. As the third invasion of the Burning Legion unfolds, the Makers Overlook becomes a sentinel realm, guarded by the vigilant gaze of monitor constructs and titan sentries. In this tumultuous era, Magni Bronzebeard, the eloquent speaker of Azeroth's world soul, unravels a concealed truth. The Overlook, beyond its lofty perch, serves as the portal to the elusive Hall of Communion, a symbiotic dance between cosmic protectors and hidden gateways. The Overlook emerges not only as a bastion against Legion's onslaught, but as a mystical threshold to a chamber echoing with the whispers of Azeroth's essence. In the aftermath of the Jailer's War, the Bronzebeard brothers embarked on a post-battle pilgrimage to the Celestial Facility. Leading the way was Magni Bronzebeard, a seasoned traveler to these cosmic realms and the chosen conduit to Azeroth's heartbeat as the Herald. With a profound link to the Titans, Magni assumed the role of a cosmic guide, navigating the hollowed halls and unveiling the veiled secrets that lay within the Overlook. As the brothers tread the path between war-torn realities, Magni, the custodian of ancient connections, unlocked the gates to revelations within the Overlook's puzzling depths. So when I was looking into this, I was really confused. So here's the thing. The way I remember it was that from Chronicles, it essentially said that the Titans couldn't come down to Azeroth because they were too large and they would actually damage Azeroth. So that's why they made the Keepers. They empowered the Keepers with their power, or a portion of their power, and sent the Keepers down to actually deal with the old gods and their minions. The only old god that the Titans ever really dealt with personally was Yasharj, if that's how you say his name. Basically, Amun Amunthul reached down and just yoinked him off of Azeroth. However, he essentially tore Yasharj in half, and his heart fell onto what is now the Veil of Eternal Blossom. Which is what, you know, Warlords of Draenor, or not Warlords of Draenor, 
Uh, my brain is shot right now. But Pandaria, that's it. <laughs> the Pandaria expansion. That was the whole thing. That was Yashar's heart, if I remember correctly. Now, in the wiki, it kept saying the Titans fought the old gods and the Titans sculpted Azeroth. To my knowledge, the Titans didn't do a whole lot with Azeroth other than find Azeroth and then essentially say, hey, we got to protect Azeroth. Let's make the Keepers to go down there and actually fight and protect Azeroth. And then they gave the Keepers the Pillars of Creation to actually shape Azeroth as they see to benefit Azeroth for the better. I could be wrong here. I'm possibly wrong. I don't terribly know. So if you do know, if I'm wrong here, feel free to correct me and just let me know. Because I say the way I remember it is that the Titans didn't do a whole lot in comparison to the Keepers when fighting the old gods and actually like sculpting Azeroth. Because in my head, either A, I don't remember the... I don't really remember the Keepers needing to sculpt Azeroth a whole lot, minus a couple of zones like we talked about today with Veil of Eternal Blossom, Ungoro, and Sholazar Basin, which Freya took upon herself to design and make her own, you know, protected area for the creatures. But otherwise, minus like certain creatures making mountains and stuff like that, I don't remember the Keepers or Titans doing a whole lot of molding of Azeroth, so I'll need to reread Chronicles or watch other videos on it, but that was my major confusion with this, and that's why I kind of went with what the wiki said, but I want to talk about it at the end. <laughs> so, if you remember it differently, if this is how you remember it, where the Titans did a lot more than I'm remembering, please let me know. Maybe the wiki's right and I'm just remembering wrong, or I don't know. Either way. Along with that, one more thing that I was a little confused about so, one of the things that the wiki says is that, that the wild gods emerged from these three locations, Angoro, Shulazar, and Veil of Eternal Blossoms. There really isn't a set reason for why the Will of Eternity's power came together here. My first guess was that they were actually really close to each other, like right around the Will of Eternity before the Sundering. However, I was very wrong, because then I looked at the map and then I realized, oh yeah, that's not right at all. Because, of course, Northrend is way up north. Shocker. And then you've got Veil of Eternal Blossom and, and Angoro way away. So, the only thing I can think of is that there's basically super powerful ley lines underneath that feed into the area. Or possibly Freya just put more power into the area. That way that they could be more protected from outside threats. Either way, I'm not terribly sure... And along with that, I'm not sure if the pylons were actually crafted by the Keepers or the Titans. Which again, just goes back to my question of how much the Titans actually did for Azeroth other than making the Keepers, sending them down there, and letting the Keepers make their minions to actually go on and help. So yeah, that was my conniption fit that I was having for at least a day trying to figure this out. <laughs> The Storm Peaks, a mountainous haven that demands utmost caution. Here, the biting cold has the power to turn anyone into a human icicle, and the relentless winds are notorious for sweeping folks right off towering cliffs. These peaks, among the loftiest in the northern realms, stand shoulder to shoulder with the mighty Thaldrassus, which is the seat of power of the dragon aspects on the Dragon Isles. Venturing into the Storm Peaks is no light-hearted affair, as high winds and unpredictable avalanches make it a playground for risk-takers. The wise sons of Hoder strongly advise travelers to bring along at least two companions, emphasizing the importance of safety in this treacherous terrain. Bearing the indelible marks of the Titan Forged Keepers, many mountains in the Storm Peaks resonate with ancient power. Notable among these peaks is the Temple of Storms, the dwelling place of the Titan Watcher Thorum. As if that weren't impressive enough, the legendary Titan City of Ulduar, a marvel in its own right, also finds its home nestled within these icy peaks. The Storm Peaks, with their daunting heights and mystical ties to the Titans, stand as a testament to both peril and wonder to the frosty corners at Northrend. The mighty North Wind once reigned supreme over the Storm Peaks, holding the land and its inhabitants, including the Tonka tribes, tightly in its grasp. 
In a courageous bid to free his people from the oppressive rule of the Northwind, Stormhoof, a valiant Tonka hero and the sibling of Chieftain Swiftspear from Camp Tonkalo, engaged in an epic battle on the Plain of Echoes. Despite weakening the Northwind, Stormhoof couldn't secure victory and succumbed to the powerful force. Lying in wait, the Northwind patiently regained its strength, concocting a sinister plan for revenge against Stormhoof and his kin. Instead of confronting them directly, it opted for a more devious strategy, to rewrite history itself. The Northwind schemed to erase Stormhoof from the records of time, manipulating the timeline to ensure its continued dominance over the Storm Peaks. The recorded history of Tongalo underwent a malevolent change, depicting Stormhoof not as the liberator of his people, but as a villain, executed for his so-called crimes. Thus, the Northwind sought not only to conquer the physical realm, but also to control the narrative, perpetuating its reign through the manipulation of the past. Now, when I was researching this, and I actually did the full quest line into this part with the Northwind, I was very confused because the Northwind isn't a time traveler. From what I understood, basically, the Northwind killed Stormhoof, and after he had killed Stormhoof, what he did is he didn't necessarily like change the timeline as they're kind of phrasing it. He just erased the history books. He changed the history books. So I don't know if it's just weird wording or if I'm just misunderstanding stuff, but that's kind of how I saw it when I was looking into this and when I did the quest. Because it seemed more like he didn't really change the timeline, like go back in time. He just realized that he could change the narrative to make Stormhoof look like the bad guy and the Northwind look solid, look like the hero. So I'm not really sure if I'm just misunderstanding something or if I just missed something in when I was doing the quest or what, but just it seems like saying that they manipulated the timeline just seemed off. Either way, that was my little gripe with it. I thought it was a cool quest though. I did think it was cool. Now let's get into some locations in Storm Peaks. I figure we can start with the main camps for the Alliance and Horde. First, let us start with the Horde, who have a base at Camp Tunkalo. Perched atop the lofty mountains in the eastern Storm Peaks, Camp Tunkalo is a quaint Tonka village with a unique vantage point. On one side, it overlooks Dunnifilum, while on the other side, it gazes upon the Plain of Echoes, home to the shattered Titan Temple of Life. This secluded spot has proven to be a sanctuary, shielding the village from the ravages of scourge attacks that have laid waste to many other Tonka settlements. The Bronzery brothers paid a visit to this remote village, initially met with cautious sentries, who observed from a safe distance. The dwarves' distinctive appearance raised eyebrows. Once recognized as not earthen or iron dwarves, a sense of politeness prevailed. Sensing the delicate balance, the dwarves, respectful of the villagers' space, chose not to overstay their modest welcome. Thus, Camp Tunkalo remained a tranquil haven where the meeting of worlds added a subtle touch of intrigue to its mountainous embrace. Next, we move over to Frosthold. Nestled in the southwestern reaches of Storm Peaks lies Frosthold, an alliance town harmoniously aligned with the Frostborn. This frosty haven is situated to the south of the Temple of Storms, and northwest of K3, perched on the same mountain as Stormcrest. Here, an entire race of frost dwarves call this icy retreat home, creating a unique settlement that sprawls around a colossal pit of ice atop the towering mountain. Reaching Frosthold isn't a stroll in the snowy park. It requires taking to the sky since there's no accessible path on foot. The Bronzebeard brothers made their way to Frosthold, where the Frostborn warmly welcomed Murad and Bronzebeard. They actually had found Murad and helped him heal when Arthas left him to die there, so he has a kinship with them ever since. Or as his friend Fjordland said to him, it's good to have two homes, you'll always have a hearth to sleep at. The visit unfolded with presentations, a hearty feast, and an evening of camaraderie, marked by shared drinks and stories. As night fell, Muradin, in a moment of trust, expressed his confidence in leaving the Frostborn in capable hands. Guided by the historian of Frosthold, he delved into the tale of an encounter between Mina Stormsmith, who was an ancestor of the brothers and the Frostborn, a saga dating back 500 years. In the heart of Frosthold, history and kinship intertwined creating a memorable chapter in the frosty highlands of Storm Peaks. 
Perched above the enchanting snowblind terrace in east of Sefrelder Village, Brunhilder Village is a frosty haven in the southern expanse of Storm Peaks. Here, the formidable Frost Vrykul tribe, Hildener, establishes its stronghold. In a fascinating departure from the Valkyrian sisters, the Hildenar resisted the allure of the Lich King's offer, steering clear of the Scourge's ranks. The mountains surrounding the village cradle the nests of the proto-drakes they skillfully ride. Within the village, a unique social order prevails, strict matriarchy. Men, in their view, find purpose mainly in labor, often relegated to the forlorn mine, located to the north, either voluntary or as captives. At the village's heart lies the Pit of the Fang, a battleground where they engage in fierce contests atop polar bears during the Hildsmit. This spirited competition determines the Hildener, who will rule alongside the esteemed Keeper Thorum. Intriguingly, the region was once home to the Xanasu clan, embarking on a quest for powerful magic to defy the Lich King. However, their journey remained shrouded in mystery, as the clan never returned from their quest, leaving behind a mysterious legacy in the frosty landscapes of Storm Peaks. In the chilly reaches of the western Storm Peaks, Valkyrian stands as a frosty haven, a settlement of the formidable Frost Vrykul. However, a frosty rift exists between them and their Hildener sisters from Brunhilder village, who harbor resentment for Valkyrian's allegiance to the Lich King. The majority of the Hildener, disdainful of serving the Lich King, resisted his emissaries. Yet Yulda the Storm Speaker, Valkyrian's leader, broke ranks and struck a chilling deal. In exchange for pledging her village's allegiance, the Lich King granted her a transformation into a Valkyr. Once in league with the Scourge during the war against the Lich King, the Hildener of Valkyrian took on a sinister role. Their task involved capturing Proto-Drakes and their eggs, leading them to the Blighted Pool. These waters, saturated with corruption and disease, aimed to unleash a plague upon the creatures, morphing them into dreaded, plagued Proto-Drakes. In the frigid tapestry of the Storm Peaks, Valkyrian's chilling saga unfolds, marked by loyalty, discord, and a dark twist of transformation. Nestled just north of Frostfield Lake lies Thunderfall, an imposing sight, a colossal and hushed burial ground haunted by wandering spirits. In ages past, corruption seized the Keeper Loken under the influence of yogg -Saron. Loken's heinous act involved the murder of his brother's wife Sif and a cunning scheme to frame King Arngrim and the Frost Giants for the crime. Thorum, consumed by wrath, hurled his mighty hammer Krolmir at Arngrim during a fierce battle with Frost Dwarves. The following explosion froze the chaotic moment in time, capturing the shockwave that sent Dwarves airborne and claimed many lives. In a final act, Arngrim enchanted Krolmir with a rune, ensuring it remained beyond anyone's grasp. Centuries later, during the conflict against the Lich King, Thorum, aided by adventurers loyal to the Sons of Hodor, unraveled the truth. Filled with remorse, he pledged to confront Loken and sought the adventurer's aid to redeem himself and rebuild the trust with the Frost Giants. At Thunderfall, with the adventurer's support and the agreement of King Yoakum, Thorum apologized for his past transgressions, and the Frost Giants forgave him, allowing Thorum to reclaim his once lost hammer. The Bronzebeard brothers explored the area with Muradin reflecting on Thunderfall as evidence of the fallibility inherent in the Keepers and their creations. In the heart of the Storm Peaks lies the intriguing Terrace of the Makers, a realm nestled in the north-central expanse just beyond the chasm from Ulduar. This complex of temples and abodes served as the home and workplace for the Keepers. Here, the anticipated artifacts destined for Ulduar found their sanctuary, yet the Terrace wears the scars of time. Its once majestic path of the titans lies broken, walkways shattered, and columns cracked or missing. Crowning the terrace are three majestic temples, the Temple of Invention, the Temple of Order, and the Temple of Winter, each situated in the northwest, the northeast, and south respectively. During the war against the Lich King, Iron Dwarves from the formidable Iron Army launched relentless attacks on the vigilant Earthen Warders, guardians of the entire terrace. Halfner the Windborn stood resolute on the central stairs leading north, while Duron the Rune Route held his post in the northern edge of the mainland, south of the imposing Ulduar. In the shadow of these ancient temples, a clash of forces unfold, echoing through the Terrace of the Makers. Perched atop the loftiest peak in the Storm Peaks, the Temple of Storm stands shrouded in mystery, a testament to the Titan's ancient craftsmanship. Snow delicately blankets its columns, and its open roof frames the sky 
allowing the dance of northern lights to intertwine with the stars. Even under the clear skies, the crackle of lightning weaves through the air, creating an ethereal ambience. This sanctuary is the domain of Thorum, the storm lord and guardian of the temple. Haunted by the loss of his wife Sif, who fell victim to the treachery of his own brother Loken, Thorum sought solace within these sacred walls for countless years. Little did he know that his eventual war against the betrayer was a cunning ploy by Loken to lure him away, enabling yogg saron and Ulduar to ensnare him, driving him into madness. After the reckoning, Thorm's vacant throne echoed the absence of the Stormlord, who had been taken to Ulduar to be corrupted by yogg saron In the aftermath of the war against the Jailer, the vigilant Bronzebeard brothers paid a visit to Thorm in his mountainous abode. Ensuring his well-being, they delved into inquiries about his loyal companion, his pet wolf, Skull, and the whereabouts of Jotun. Amidst the whispers of ancient mysteries, the Temple of Storms remained a sanctuary where past sorrows and present concerns converged. He says he hasn't seen either of them, but hopes Skull will find his way home soon. Now who is Jotun? Jotun is the cherished companion of Keeper Tyr through countless ages. She had a profound bond with the Keeper. When Galakron devoured Tyr's hand, an unyielding friendship led them to embark on a quest within the depths of Azeroth. Together they unearthed a precious silver vein from which Jotun crafted a remarkable prosthetic silver hand for the Keeper. Intriguingly, at Tyr's request, Jotun inscribed the Keeper's new symbol onto his warhammer, forever naming it the Silver Hand. When Tyr and his followers sought refuge in the south of the stolen disk of Norganon, Jotun opted for a different path. Motivated by the ideals of personal sacrifice embraced by the Keeper, he remained behind to divert Loken's attention, facilitating the escape of Tyr's allies. Unfortunately, this act of heroism led to Jotun's capture, and Loken, with malice, cursed his mind. Bound by the curse, Jotun became an unwilling instrument, compelled to scour the lands around Ulduar, now Northrend, to obliterate Tyr, his symbols, and those who embraced his ideals. In a tragic twist, Jotun's first act under the curse shattered the very anvil that had shaped Tyr's silver hand and transformed his hammer, cursed to be unable to die but wishing to have his nightmare end. During the third invasion of the Burning Legion, Galford, a valiant member of Tyr's guard carrying a luminous spark of Tyr, embarked on a daring journey to the frosty lands of Northrend. His mission, to seek assistance in reclaiming the legendary silver hand from the forsaken ground of Tyr's fall. Guided by the Radiant Spark, Galford traversed the path of the Titans, where an unexpected encounter awaited him, the Watcher Jotun. Unbeknownst to Galford, the Spark withheld a crucial detail about Jotun's cursed fate. In a tragic turn of events, Jotun, ensnared by the Watcher's curse, slew Galford and claimed the Spark. However, the tale took an unexpected twist when Lanagosa, a majestic dragon and a valiant paladin adventurer joined forces to track down Galford's assailant. In a fierce confrontation, they confronted Jotun, and the ensuing struggle briefly liberated his mind from the clutches of Loken's curse. In a moment of clarity, Jotun relinquished the spark to the paladin, urging them to escape before the madness reclaimed him. As the paladin and Lanagosa made their hasty retreat, Jotun, haunted by the specter of his own curse, implored them to preserve the memory of his dear friend Tyr. In the frosty embrace of Northrend, a tale of sacrifice, curse, and fleeting redemption unfolded on the path of the Titans. Now we move on to the dungeons. First, we enter the Halls of Stone. Within the Halls of Stone, there are four bosses along with the Forge of Wills. Before delving into the details, we unravel an intriguing tale about an ancestor of the Bronzebeard Brothers. The story unfolds when they ventured to visit Ulduar after concluding the war with the Jailer. Their exploration unearthed the lingering presence of iron doors within the mysterious Halls of Stone. Intrigued by the mysteries of their ancestry, the brothers engaged one of the nameless Iron Dwarves in conversation, seeking insights into the journey of their ancestor, Mina Stormsmith. The nameless Iron Dwarf, a witness to Mina's arrival 500 years ago, recounted a gripping tale of Shawnir the Iron Shaper's attempt to annihilate her. Mina had approached Ulduar with a heartfelt plea to resurrect her fallen brother. However, the cold logic of the Iron Dwarves deemed her request unacceptable, as she was made of flesh and she was seen as weak in their eyes leading Shawnir to command her execution. Undeterred, Mina valiantly battled successive waves of Iron Dwarves until her trusty axe shattered in the relentless struggle. In a moment of divine intervention, a spirit bathed in blinding light intervened, rescuing her from the clutches of death. With her new determination, Mina grasped her broken weapon and fought her way out of the formidable depths of Ulduar, leading behind a legacy of resilience and the echoes of a celestial rescue. 
Now within the Halls of Stone, you have four bosses, the Maiden of Grief, Crystallis, Tribunal of Ages, and Shanir the Iron Shaper. First, let's talk about the Maiden of Grief. Loken may rule over the Dominion of Ulduar, but not every inhabitant is a loyal follower. The Maiden of Grief, burdened with the grim task of thwarting those attempting to reclaim the Halls of Stone, carries out her orders reluctantly. She is a good soldier. A tinge of sorrow colors her actions as she turns against former allies, yet she wields her sorrow forged weapons with a fierce determination, blending the pain of her heartache into a fierceful purpose. We next find Crystallis. In the realm of war, victory isn't solely a product of strength, but a result of formidable armies. Embracing this fundamental truth, Loken issued an order to craft steadfast stone constructs, augmenting the might of his legions. Tasked with overseeing this monumental operation is Crystallis, a formidable force poised to crush any intruder daring to jeopardize its crucial mission. After the thievery of the Dis of Norganon by Tyr, Arcetus, and Irenea, Loken devised the Tribunal of Ages as their successor. Crafting a narrative to conceal his own misdeeds, he tailored historical events within the Tribunal to suit his preferences. Yet this archive, meant to be a seamless cover-up, turned out to be inherently flawed. The histories contained within took on a life of their own, twisting even beyond Loken's grasp of understanding. Consequently, the Tribunal of Ages stands as a testament to the muddled echoes of history, far from being a reliable record. Now the final boss is Shanir the Iron Shaper. Serving as one of Loken's most trusted lieutenants, Shanir the Iron Shaper assumed the role of Master of the Forge of Wills. Shanir, with an apparent zeal, eagerly crafted iron creations to please his master. Fond of boasting about the perceived weakness of the earth and beings and considering flesh creatures frail, he held a disdain for them. As the war against the Lich King unfolded, Shanir met his demise at the hands of the Alliance during their raid on Ulduar. His once formidable dagger, the Flesh Shaper, ended up in the possession of those he had deemed so fragile. Now a quick little mention of the Forge of Wills and the Forge of Origination, but I'll go into a more detailed explanation on each when I do a video on the Titans and the Keepers. The Forge of Wills, as mentioned before, which is located within the Halls of Stone, can draw on the life essence of Azeroth itself, giving shape and sentience to creatures of living stone and metal. The Forge of Origination, which is located in Oldham to the south, would be used to cleanse the planet if the flora and fauna became corrupted and could be activated by Algalon the Observer so the planet could start anew. Now we move on to the Halls of Lightning. Nestled in the vast titan city of Ulduar, the Halls of Lightning, situated in the east, served as the ominous workshop of the duplicitous Loken. Once a loyal servant of the Pantheon and a prime sentinel, he now toiled in treachery, churning out legions of iron Vrykul to execute his dark master's sinister designs. From his imposing throne, Loken orchestrated his forces, flanked by storm and fire elementals along with his most formidable servants and commanders. In the heart of his formidable domain, adventurers faced the ultimate showdown, challenging Loken in his last stand. The echoes of battle sounded through the Halls of Lightning, marking the decisive moment when the treacherous Prime Sentinel met his ultimate defeat. Now within the Halls of Lightning, you have four bosses. General Varngrim, Vulcan, Ionar, and Loken. First, let's start with General Varngrim. In the mighty legion of Loken's iron forces, one figure towers above them all, the indomitable General Varngrim. At the forefront of Loken's Halls of Lightning, this iron commander ruthlessly enforces his master's dominion, ensuring that any intruders in their path meet a swift and uncompromising end. Now the next boss you encounter is Vulcan, and he has quite a longer backstory than the others, basically the same length as Loken. We start back in the Winter Scorn War. As far as the time frame for the Winter Scorn Wars, I hadn't found an actual time date, like 500 years before the Dark Portal type of things for some dates. This one just gave me many years after Loken's betrayal, so take with that what you will, and if you actually find a date, uh, let me know, because I wasn't able to find one. But let's talk about the Winter Scorn Wars. In the vast expanse of the storm peaks surrounding Ulduar, Vulcan and Ignis eyed a land ripe for conquest, their fiery ambitions ablaze. Recognizing the need for a formidable army, the fire giants set their sights on the fierce Winter Scorn clan of Rykul. Through forceful means, they seized control of the clan, igniting the flames of battle lust and crafting armor and weapons designed to counter the other titan forged. As the newly formed army prepared for conquest, the dreaded curse of flesh struck, 
affecting their forces. Undeterred by this setback, Vulcan and Ignis pressed on with their goal, acknowledging that relying solely on the Winter Scorn would no longer suffice. To bolster their ranks, the giants sculpted potent molten golems and iron constructs of their own creation. The massive Winter Scorn army descended upon the unsuspecting Earth and storming their underground lairs and leaving devastation in their wake. Survivors from the Earth and sought refuge with Tyr, Arcetus, and Ironea, who had managed to elude Loken's pursuit. Outraged by the tales of destruction, Tyr and his companions rushed to the Earthen's aid, leading the bravest Earthen in skirmishes against the Winter Scorn. Tyr, Arcetus, and Ironea fortified defense to fend off further assaults. Eventually, the combined forces of the Earthen and their allies repelled the Winter Scorn. Undeterred by their initial failure, Vulcan and Ignis returned to their fiery forges, fashioning an even more formidable army. Beyond golems and construct, they crafted enchanted snares to enslave entire flights of proto-dragons. These winged creatures turned into instruments of war. The dragons were armed with fiery weapons to sow terror among the Earthen. The ensuing Winter Scorn assaults shattered the Earthen's defenses, forcing them to scatter across icy mountain passes. Vrykul and Golems pursued them on the ground, while Proto-Dragons launched attacks from the skies. Even the formidable trio of Tyr, Arcetus, and Ironea had to flee from the relentless fury of the Winter Scorn. In a turn of fortune, Tyr rallied the dragon aspects to his cause. Together, they shattered the Golems and constructs forged by Ignis and Vulcan, freed the enslaved Proto-Dragons, and plunged the Winter Scorn into a deep slumber, bringing an end to the harrowing conflict. Amid the war against the Lich King, Vulcan, following Loken's orders, found his dwelling within the Halls of Lightning, nestled in the Iron Crucible. Tirelessly toiling day and night, he dedicated himself to crafting golems, amplifying the ranks of Loken's formidable armies. The relentless endeavor posed a severe threat to the sons of Hoder, who deemed him a danger and issued a decree for his demise. Now we move on to Ironar. Loken doesn't lean solely on his iron minions for personal defense. Instead, he harnesses the raw power of lightning itself. In a curious alliance, Ionar and its companions found refuge within the Halls of Lightning, offering unwavering loyalty and a readiness to ruthlessly eliminate any who dare challenge their newfound master. Now we move on to the one who caused so much trouble for us on Azeroth and the other keepers, Loken. With him I figure it works to go into his full backstory, and the others will get their stories told when I do a video on them and the Titans. Loken, a keeper forged by the Pantheon to lead the Titan forged armies against the Old Gods received his power from Norganon. In a fierce battle alongside Mimiron, they triumphed over Neptulon the Tidehunter. However, Loken's life took a tragic turn when an affair with Sif, his brother Thorm's wife, led to a disastrous accident. Manipulated by the imprisoned Yogg Saron, Loken, driven by fear of losing Sif, inadvertently caused her death. Overwhelmed with guilt but afraid to confess to Thorm, Loken deceived his brother, blaming Ardengrim, the king of frost giants, for the tragedy. To end the ensuing war, Loken created an army using the Forge of Wills, unknowingly spreading the curse of flesh that would transform Titanforged into flesh. Desperate to conceal his actions, Loken orchestrated Mimiron's death, subdued Hoder and Freya with yogg -Saron's corruption, and convinced Helia to imprison Odin in the Halls of Valor. Learning of the Pantheon's demise, he exiled all Titan Force from Ulduar and withdrew into its depths. The only witnesses to Loken's betrayal were Tyr and Arcetus who alongside Ironea and allies, stole the discs of Norganon to uncover the extent of his treachery. In pursuit, Loken sent monstrous Cathraxi, but Tyr sacrificed himself, allowing his comrades to escape with the discs. Terrified of the consequences of Tyr's group exposed his actions to Algalon, Loken fabricated the Tribunal of Ages, filling it with false information to cover his tracks, manipulating the signal to Algalon. He ensured no living being could contact him until Loken's death. The complex web of deception and tragedy unfolded within the shadows of Ulduar's depths. For countless millennia, yogg -Saron languished in captivity, holding the Keepers, including Loken, in a muted state within Ulduar. His control over them was feeble, and attempts to persuade them into directly aiding the Old God had met with resistance. The turning point came with Cho'Gal, a member of the Old God-worshipping Twilight Hammers clan, infiltrated Ulduar, weakening yogg -Saron's chains. Suddenly, the entity's influence of the Keepers intensified, transforming as sturdy as iron. Under yogg command, Loken was tasked with using the Forge of Wills to fashion a new army. In Loken's skilled hands, the Forge unleashed hordes of iron dwarves in Vrykul, hungry only for bloodshed and war. 
During the war against the Lich King, Thorm, aided by adventurers aligned with the Sons of Hoder, unraveled the truth and reclaimed his weapon and armor. Fueled by righteous fury, he confronted his treacherous brother in a bid for justice. However, it proved to be an intricate deception orchestrated by Loken. The ruse successfully lured Thorm from the safety of the Temple of Storms, where proximity to his dark master granted Loken the power to withstand Thorm's assault. Subsequently, Loken captured Thorm and his loyal protodrake, Varanus, intending to plunge them into madness through the influence of Yogg Saron. Loken's schemes extended to enlisting Ignis the Furnace Master for transformative tasks. One notable instance involving morphing Varanus into the formidable plated monstrosity known as Razor Scale. Additionally, Loken commissioned the creation of Kolagarn, a colossal stone construct to guard the shattered walkway leading to Ulduar's inner halls. Upon Loken's demise in the Halls of Lightning, he ominously proclaimed that his death heralded the world's end. The map of Azeroth erupted in flames, launching a beacon of light skyward. As revealed by the Archivum Consul in Ulduar, Loken's death triggered the Algalon failsafe, an emergency signal leading to the arrival of Algalon the Observer. This signal potential planetary failure, initiating a diagnostic process with two possible outcomes. Reply code Alpha indicated all was well, while reply code Omega signified planetary reorigination. When questioned about the latter, the Consul explained the Titan's plan, the complete destruction of Azeroth and its life forms, followed by the meticulous reconstruction of the planet from its base elements. In essence, the dire warning in Loken's dying breath hinted at the catastrophic consequence of his demise, a potential reset of Azeroth through the Titan's reorigination process. Now we move on to many people's favorite raid, Ulduar. First, let's start off with the official Blizzard description of it, and then move on to the history of this grand structure. For millennia, Ulduar has remained undisturbed by mortals, far away from their concerns and their struggles. Yet since its recent discovery, many have wondered what the structure's original purpose may have been. Some thought it a city built to herald the glory of its makers. Some thought it a vault containing immeasurable treasures, perhaps even relics of the mighty titans themselves. Such speculations were wrong. Beyond Uduar's gates lies no city, no treasure vault, no final answer to the titans' mysteries. All that awaits those who dare set foot in Uduar is a horror even the titans could not, would not destroy, an evil they merely contained. Beneath ancient Ulduar, the old god of death lies, whispering, tread carefully, or its prison will become your tomb. Now let's look at the history of Ulduar. Upon the triumph over Galakrond, the proto-dragons earned the admiration of the Keepers, who sought the Titan's blessing for their new guardianship of Azeroth. However, Odin, the resolute prime designate and leader of the Keepers, harbored distrust toward the proto-dragons preferring his vision of an elite force characterized by unwavering valor. He set his sights on the Vrykul, offspring of the Titan Forged, as the ideal candidates for his army. Despite the objections from other keepers, Odin remained steadfast in his pursuit of this unique endeavor. Within the hollowed halls of Ulduar, Odin designed a section to serve as the headquarters for this envisioned army. Within the hollowed halls of Ulduar, Odin designed a section to serve as the headquarters for his envisioned army. Calling upon his friend and Titan Forge sorceress Helia, he harnessed her power to separate this portion of Ulduar and suspend it in ethereal skies above Azeroth. This celestial abode, known as the Halls of Valor, became the dwelling place of the formidable Valajar, and the ultimate reward for the most deserving Vrykul warriors who were summoned to serve Odin eternally. While Ulduar dutifully contained yogg saron its performance was incomplete, allowing the old god's malevolent influence to seep through. Yogg-Saron's dark essence permeated the continent, crystallizing into Saronite and corrupting everything it touched. His insidious whispers accompanied the spread of Saronite, tempting countless souls into madness, including the Keeper Loken. After millennia in captivity, Yogg-Saron's shackles began to slacken, allowing the malevolent entity to seize control of the prison. Following his insidious commands, Loken launched an assault on the city wrestling control from the resident earth and populating the Forge of Wills with Iron Dwarves and Vrykul. These newly forged creatures expelled the remaining earthen and mecha gnomes from Ulduar, venturing into Northrend to sow chaos. In the aftermath of the Lich King's defeat, Auric Trueheart dedicated his time around Ulduar to uncovering the tales of Tyr, the only Titan Keeper who confronted Loken during his betrayal. 
Additionally, he stumbled upon a Vrykul saga recounting the creation of a formidable shield crafted by Tyr for his Vrykul champion. During these events, the modest alliance and horde encampments gave way to a more substantial settlement known as Copperpot Camp, run by the human Chester Copperpot and safeguarded by the vigilant Copperpot goons. This medium-sized camp became a focal point, complete with a nearby meeting stone for travelers. Amidst the third invasion by the Burning Legion, Uluar appeared to have shed its previous corruption, with the Earthen and Mechanomes reclaiming control under the watchful eyes of their keepers. The defensive systems now included Iron Vrykul, Frost Giants, and Iron Dwarves seamlessly integrated into Uluar's operations. Notably, the facility seemed designed for regular visitors, complete with visitor information representatives and curators ensuring accessibility and maintenance. Visitors were even encouraged to share their feedback through a visitor satisfaction survey. However, during the Legion's assault, demons infiltrated Ulduar, driven by the quest to unearth information leading to the Pillars of Creation. Adding to the chaos, the whispers of the once defeated old god yogg saron echoed once more, accompanied by the return of the Enraki groups, their purpose shrouded in mystery. In a second attack, the Legion targeted Ulduar to capture Hodor, triggered a fierce defense by the Valajar forces who valiantly repelled the invaders. The Bronzier brothers brought news that Ulduar was in the process of reconstruction following the Legion's assault. The resilient Earth and Mechanomes had reclaimed their positions, graciously incorporating the liberated Iron Dwarves into their fold. Despite yogg sarans defeat and his lifeless form securely confined, the echoes of his whispers lingered, resonating not only across Northrend, but also within the very halls of Ulduar. Now there are quite a few bosses within the raid, and I could go over every single one of them, but some don't have much lore, and others I plan to do a full video on, like with the Keepers. But there are a couple I feel are worth going over due to their lore. So first, let's go over Razor Scale. I've mentioned Razor Scale a little bit, but I think it's worth talking a little bit more about Razor Scale. In the majestic Storm Peaks, Varanus reigns as the revered brood mother of the Proto Dragons. She roamed freely until Thorm desired his loyal drake by his side once again to confront his duplicitous brother. It had been a long time since they had ridden together. When the adventurer assists Thorm in reclaiming his old friend, finding her at her nest, they face Loken. However, things don't go as planned as discussed earlier. The story takes a sad turn. Instead of defeating Loken as Thorm had envisioned, he and Varanus are taken captive into Ulduar. While Thorm falls under Yogg-Saron's control, Varanus is manipulated as well, with metal plates attached to her body by Ignis, and she becomes Razor Scale. She becomes lost when Yogg takes over her mind, forcing the adventurers to end her life, preventing her from soaring freely again. In the end, we hope she is at peace. Next up we have Algalon the Observer. After Azeroth's grand reshaping, the Pantheon geared up for their departure eager to seek out New World souls. As a parting gift, they selected the Constellar Algalon the Observer to stand sentinel and watch over the world. Amenthul, foreseeing the potential havoc the Old Gods could wreak, took precautionary measures. In case corruption threatened to engulf Azeroth, Algalon would be summoned to assess the situation. Based on his findings, Algalon would either transmit the benign reply code Alpha if corruption was absent, or the ominous reply code Omega if it was present. Omega, once triggered, would activate the Forge of Origination, purging the planet of life and corruption. Despite the devastation, the world's soul would endure. Algalon's presence on Azeroth could be prompted by two scenarios, either a direct summoning through Titan machinery in Ulduar or elsewhere, or the demise of the Prime Designate, the Pantheon's chosen defender responsible for safeguarding the planet, overseeing yogg prison, and maintaining the Forge of Wills. Driven to the brink of madness by the Pantheon's deafening silence and haunted by the whispers of yogg saron Keeper Loken succumbed to the turmoil within. The unintentional demise of his beloved Sif further fueled his descent into insanity. In a daring move, Loken orchestrated a coup against his fellow Keepers within the confines of Ulduar. Emerging victorious over what he perceived as threats, Loken seized control of the facility's machinery. In a bold and audacious act, he crowned himself Prime Designate snatching the esteemed title from the grass of Keeper Odin. Paralyzed by the fear that one of his fellow Keepers might expose his treachery by contacting Algalon or the Titans, Loken took drastic measures. He deliberately sabotaged Ulduar's communication devices, forever silencing any connection to the Pantheon or Azeroth's Celestial Guardian. In the midst of the war against the Lich King, 
Logan and his formidable armies posed a dire threat to the world's delicate equilibrium. The Prime Designate met his end in the Halls of Lightning, defeated by champions representing both the Horde and the Alliance. As the news of Logan's demise echoed, Algalon the Observer swiftly returned to Azeroth, prompted by the signal of the Fallen Keeper's death. Venturing deeper into the facility after conquering the malevolent old god yogg saron adventurers guided by the intrepid Bran Bronzebeard reached the Celestial Planetarium. There, they bore witness to the arrival of Algalon, initiating his critical analysis of Azeroth's corruption levels. The Constellar issued a grave warning. If systemic corruption was detected, he would be compelled to trigger the reorigination process, deeming it necessary for the greater cosmic order. As Bran sought to disrupt Algalon's signal, his companions engaged in a fierce battle to thwart the Observer's attempt to commence the Purge. Despite Algalon's assertion that the mortals were destined to lose, the champions emerged victorious, challenging the Constellar's preconceptions about the flaws of their kind. Acknowledging the fallibility of his calculations, Algalon amended the reply code to abort reorigination, bestowing the code upon Bran and his allies. He cautioned that in the absence of a response from the Observer, reorigination would proceed regardless. He advised Bran to send the code from somewhere close to the sky. Algalon then vanished, choosing to observe Azeroth from a distant vantage point in the years to follow. Bran, convinced that Dalaran was the ideal location for transmitting the signal, hurriedly left Ulduar. Racing to the Mage City, he handed the code to Ronan, the leader of the Kirin Tor. In the Eventide City, Ronan passionately delivered his speech as he transmitted the message, unleashing a breathtaking display of colors and light that more importantly spared Azeroth from the impending purge of life. Now we move on to yogg saron the last boss of the raid, but also the one that has caused so much trouble for everyone over the years. In the ancient records of Azeroth's history, yogg saron is a profoundly malevolent old god. He wielded a chaotic tyranny that reverberated across the world. He orchestrated the creation of the Curse of Flesh, a malevolent design aimed at assimilating the Titans' ingenious creations. When the Titans engaged in a cosmic war against the Old Gods, aiming to obliterate their citadels, a grim revelation surfaced. The infestation of these entities had become so entwined with Azeroth that eradicating the Old Gods would spell the doom of the world itself. Faced with this dire conundrum, the Pantheon opted for a different strategy. Rather than obliterating the Old Gods, they chose to neutralize their power and bind them within Azeroth for the enduring lifespan of the world. yogg surround found its home in the depths of Ulduar, nestled in the far northern realms of the flourishing planet. Six titanic watchers, Loken, Thorm, Hoder, Tyr, Mimiron, and Freya, were appointed as vigilant custodians, tasked with ensuring the near-eternal captivity of this malevolent force. Yet the imprisonment was not absolute. Yogg-Saron's malevolent influence manifested as Saronite, a dark substance that permeated the continent, crystallizing and corrupted all it touched. The whispers of the imprisoned entity insinuated themselves with the Saronite, seducing many into the throes of madness, including the Keeper Loken. The haunting legacy of Yogg-Saron's presence echoed through the ages, leaving a lingering mark on Azeroth. For eons, Yogg-Saron held the Keepers, including Loken, in a quiet and complacent state. His influence over them was feeble, struggling to convince them to directly serve the Old God. However, the arrival of Cho'Gall from Twilight's Hammer Clan changed the game. Cho'Gall weakened yogg sarans chains, unleashing an iron-strong surge of influence over the Keepers. yogg sarans malevolence extended beyond Ulduar, corrupting the roots of the world tree Vordrasil, leading to the creation of the Emerald Nightmare. Despite the immediate destruction of Vordrasil, the corruption persisted, affecting the Grizzlemoth Firbolgs, who later inhabited its remains. Yogg-Saron's impact on Azeroth's history became evident during the Ulduar Raid, where adventurers witnessed visions connected to key moments in the world's past. First, the creation of the Dragon Soul by Naltharion and the other dragon aspects emerged during the War of the Ancients, marking the cataclysmic Great Sundering. The assassination of King Lame by Garona followed, sealing the fate of Stormwind at the conclusion of the First War. Lastly, a haunting vision materialized, revealing the Lich King's torment of Bolvar Fordragon destined to become the new Lich King after Arthas Menethil's demise. Within the eerie echoes of this final vision, the voice of yogg saron resonated, proclaiming a prophecy that would unfold with Arthas' defeat by the Ashen Verdict. He will learn, no king rules forever, only death is eternal. These foreboding words, chillingly echoed by Tyrannus Menethil's spirit in his final moments, mark the unavoidable path of destiny and demise. 
As the old god's voice echoed prophecies during the encounter, foretelling the demise of kings and the eternal nature of death. Adventurers from the Alliance and Horde, guided by Bran Bronzebeard, rose to the challenge and ultimately defeated yogg -Saron. Now one last thing I'd like to mention is the Curse of Flesh. The Curse of Flesh turns those beings made of stone and metal into flesh. And thanks to that, it actually gave us the dwarves, gnomes, and humans, along with a few other races, but I figure I'll cover those in another video later on. So I'd like to go over those three, since I think it's nice to know more about the races that we play every day, or have played in the past. First up is the dwarves. The titans forged the earth and to sculpt the deep reaches of the world. When Arkidas and his companions pilfered the disc of Norganon from Loken, they embarked on a journey southward to Oldaman. With a handful of earth and in mechanomes, they concealed the stolen disc within the ancient halls. Fearing the looming curse of flesh, the earthen pleaded for a respite, entering a dormant state until a remedy could be discovered. In a selfless act, the Mechanomes, cognizant of their shared curse, offer to remain vigilant and guard over their earthen brethren during their extended slumber. Most of the earthen eventually turned into dwarves, but not all of them. There remains a sizable population of earthen in Deepholm, Oldaman, and Ulduar. Now while quite a few earthen sought refuge within Oldaman, not all of them did. Others rallied alongside the Night Elves under the command of Gerard Shadowsong to confront the impending threat of the Burning Legion. As the War of the Ancients unfolded, culminating in the cataclysmic implosion of the Well of Eternity and the subsequent Great Sundering, the still-awakening Earthen keenly felt the reverberation of the Earth's agony. Overwhelmed by the shared pain, they retreated to their ancestral sanctuaries, the Titan cities of Oldham, Oldaman, and Ulduar, and entered a prolonged hibernation. In their absence, the responsibility of safeguarding Oldaman fell upon the Mechanomes. With the passing of time, many of these mechanical beings departed or succumbed to wear and tear, until one resilient mechanome remained. Realizing her days were numbered, she expended her last reserves of energy to activate the hibernation chambers, ensuring the earth would not be consigned to oblivion in the vaults, a poignant gesture before her inevitable demise. Upon awakening, a considerable number of them discovered a curious transformation. Their once formidable command over stone and earth had diminished and their stony exteriors had changed into the softness of smooth skin. With newfound forms, these flesh earth ventured beyond the Titan city and over time laid the foundations of Ironforge in the rugged landscapes of Dunmoreau. Upon the rugged landscapes they claimed as their own, the dwarves bestowed the name Kazmadan, a tribute to the mighty Titan shaper Kazgaroth, in reverence to their Titan progenitor. The dwarves erected a giant altar, a sacred space within the mountain's core, it was here amidst the stony depths that they forged a monumental forge. This forge birthed the city, destined to be known as Iron Forge. Throughout the ages, in the heart of Kazmadan, the dwarves, skilled artisans of the earth, laid the foundation for a legacy that resonated with the echoes of the titans. Now we move on to the gnomes. In the aftermath of Loken's betrayal, the mechanomes in Oldaman found themselves thrust into the role of caretakers for the facility, sharing their responsibility with a handful of earthen who had remained active. Arkidas and Irenea, consumed by their quest to cure the curse of flesh, descended into the lower chambers of Oldaman, entering prolonged periods of hibernation, leaving the mechanomes and the remaining earthen to navigate the intricacies of the facility. With the cataclysmic great sundering, the earthen entered stasis, leaving the mechanomes to the sole custodians. However, even they were not immune to the relentless curse of flesh, leading to their transformation into the beings we now recognize as gnomes. Stripped of purpose and direction, the gnomes abandoned Oldaman, severing ties 3,000 years before the Dark Portal's emergence. The initial generation of gnomes faced the harsh challenges of the frigid mountains west of Oldaman, contending with unforgiving weather, ice trolls, and various perils that lurked in the surroundings. Over the passing generations, their focus shifted to technological progress, recognizing it as the key to survival in their hostile environment. In a few short generations, the gnomes relinquished their knowledge of Titan-forged origins, forging a new society. Deep within the frosty peaks of what would later be called Dunmoreau, they constructed heavily fortified homes, crafting a resilient society that thrived amidst the rugged wilderness. Humans traced their ancestry back to the Vrykul, a formidable race of half-giants hailing from Northrend, originally created by the Titans. Around 15,000 years before the Dark Portal, the Curse of Flesh emerged causing Dragonflayer Vrykul women to bear small and deformed offspring, deemed aberrations by King Yimaron, ruler of the Dragonflayer clan, 
These children faced destruction, yet some were hidden by their parents among a Vrykul community in Tirisfal Glades, later forming the foundations of the northern eastern kingdoms. Through the passing of ages, these afflicted Vrykul descendants, known as humans, continued their degeneration into mortal beings. As millennia unfolded, human tribes thrived in the eastern kingdoms, navigating conflicts with both rival tribes and the forest trolls of the Imani Empire for territory and dominance. The truth of their Vrykul heritage remained shrouded and forgotten by humanity until the fateful encounter of Vrykul in Northrend during the war against the Lich King. Imagine a vast region, comparable in size to Grizzly Hills, but entirely consumed by one colossal city. It's a sprawling expanse of plazas, ziggurats, towering walls, and aqueducts that seem to stretch endlessly. Throughout the city, massive altars stand prominently, starting from the second tier of Zoldrak and reaching upward. These altars were once sacred places where the Drakari fervently worshipped the wild gods, or as the trolls called them, Loa. Magni Bronzebeard attests that the entire place is saturated with a dark energy and an aura of death. Not stemming from the scourge, but rather from the profound suffering of these gods, casting a haunting stain upon the land. Drakari ice trolls rule the land from their capital, Gundrak. While it lacks the magnificence of storm peaks or the warmth of grizzly hills, this troll-dominated zone draws few visitors, except for bold explorers seeking encounters with the Drakari. The Argentan returns to play a crucial role, alongside the Zandalar tribe aiming to preserve the Drakari history. Soldrak itself is a monument to a shattered civilization. As players venture into the zone, they witness the encroaching scourge, especially around the besieged Argent stand. Amidst the chaos, conflicts erupt between diverse factions, with crazed Drakari, Nerubians, and water elementals summoned by the desperate trolls. The weakened forms of the Drakari's Loa linger in the northeast, near Gundrak, while a scourge-controlled blight zone casts its shadows south of Ebon Watch, near Draktheron Keep. During a meeting of the troll tribes held during Cataclysm, it is revealed by Prophet Zol that Zoldrak had fallen to the scourge. After the war against the Jailer, the Bronzebeard brothers ventured into the region, the report painted a picture of Zoldrak succumbing to ruin, having long been overrun by the Scourge. With the surviving Drakari scattered and undead wandering freely, the brothers approached with caution, marveling at the sights from a safe distance. Unsurprisingly, the remnants revealed numerous Drakari artifacts waiting to be discovered. Additionally, the brothers noted the undead ice trolls pouring from Drak there on Keep had a singular focus, to utterly destroy Zoldrak. Long ago, Drakthiron Keep stood as a stalwart fortress on the fringes of the Drakari Trolls realm Zoldrak. A bastion that once defended the trolls, it now finds itself in the clutches of the Lich King following a relentless scourge onslaught. The fallen defenders of the keep transformed into undead minions, march relentlessly into the heart of Drakari territory. In the face of the scourge invasion, the Drakari resisted fiercely, even managing to bring down the necropolis Kolramis. Yet the crash did not extinguish all threats as the Hathar Nerubians, under the control of the sinister Malas the Corrupter, survived and began raising the dead. The desperate struggle for survival unfolded as the Trikari sought to exact more power from their ancient gods, resorting to subduing and sacrificing them. The wild deity's potent blood became a crucial resource to repel the encroaching Lich King's forces. Amidst the turmoil, brave adventurers ventured into the besieged region, clashing with the savage Trikari and their deranged prophets. However, whispers circulated of a greater peril lying dormant within Gundrak, the capital of the Ice Trolls Empire. Deep within the city, sacred shrines resonated with the mojo of slain gods, empowering twisted Drakari High Prophets. Unchecked, these prophets could unleash chaos, plunging the entire region into turmoil. In a desperate bid to combat the Scourge, the trolls of Zoldrak attempted to summon water elementals, inadvertently birthing malevolent water wavelengths. Amidst these events, the Zandalari of Zim Torga watched with keen interest, seeking to preserve the unraveling history of the Chikari tribe before it vanished forever. The looming threat of madness and the impending obliteration of their legacy drive the Zandalari to salvage what they can from the clutches of chaos. Within Zoldrak, they have various shrines to different Loas, and I feel they each deserve to be talked about due to how important the Loa are to troll culture, and it being a big part of the zone. The Loa that are being worshipped here are Arkoa, Mamtuth, Quetzlan, Runuk, and Seratus. The altar of Harkoa is located northeast of Kolramis in Zoldrak. Harkoa's prophet, instead of sacrificing her, felt it would be better to hold her captive, possibly to drain her slowly and still get her power instead of outright sacrificing her and getting her power that way. They don't really say specifically that I could find, but that's my guess. 
When the Drakari turned against their gods, Harkoa stood as the last one to be subdued. The troll swiftly harnessed her power to curse her own children. Witch Doctor Khufu managed to reach out to other gods, prompting adventurers to come to Harkoa's aid. Once her children were freed, Harkoa directed the adventurers to assist other Loa like Runak, Quetzlun, and Akali. However, she couldn't help some, like Mamtuth, which saddened her deeply. In a twist, Akali met his end at the hands of his prophet. Harkoa and Witch Doctor Khufu teamed up to ensure the prophet's demise. Personally joining the fight, she guided adventurers to make sure the prophet was defeated. After this, she sent them to meet Tolmar, who instructed them to dismantle the Gundrak leadership. She also has a mate named Loknahak, who can be found in Sholazar Basin. Once, the altar of Mamtuth stood proud, a temple nestled southeast of Zolmath's stronghold. Its purpose? To sacrifice the Mammoth God. However, when Mamtuth discovered the sinister plot of his worshippers to sacrifice him and seize his power, he took matters into his own hands, metaphorically. Mamtuth obliterated himself, his temple, and all those present, birthing the Mamtuth crater in the aftermath. Now all that lingers is a crater teeming with an eerie blue ooze, which is what remained of his blood, a haunting reminder of his sacrificial demise. His children can be found trampling the formal disciples around the crater. After the war against the jailers, the Bronzebeard brothers visited the altar and reported that the crater was still crawling with his blood. However, there is a bright side. While thought to be gone forever, his spirit is recovering in a wild seed in the tranquil pools of Ardenweald. The altar of Quetzlun stands as a temple devoted to the wind serpent goddess herself. Guarded by formidable wind serpents and air wardens, this place exudes an air of divine protection. When the Drakari, facing the scourge invasion, resorted to sacrificing their Loa, Quetzalan took drastic measures. She conjured a private underworld nightmare just before her physical form succumbed to destruction. In this dark realm, she ensnared her former worshippers and high priests, ensuring they faced the consequences of their betrayal. Surprisingly, her prophet managed to evade this fate. Later, her spirit aided the adventurers in seeking vengeance upon her prophet. Through a ritual, she was summoned into the material realm, enabling her to reclaim her power from the prophet. With her restored strength, she drew him into her underworld domain, perpetually condemning him to eternal and repetitive demise. In the aftermath of the Jailer's War, the Bronzebeard brothers explored the altar. Their report? The temple stands strong, wind serpents still grace its presence, and an eerie aura persists in the air. In the chilly reaches of Zoldrak, the altar of Runuk stands, an icy temple dedicated to honoring him, the Arctic Bear God. Surrounded by vast stretches of snow, it befits the realm of this polar bear deity. As the Jakari turned to sacrifice in their Loa to combat the encroaching scourge, Runuk faced a grim fate. His physical form endured, kept alive by his corrupted followers, while his spirit remained trapped and tormented. Relegated to the role of a helpless spectator, a group of brave adventurers emerged as saviors, putting an end to Runuk's prolonged suffering and released him from his torment. He tells you that it needs to be done, and he apologizes as he fights back, saying, Even for me, the will to survive is strong. However, upon returning the quest to Harkoa, she says, He someday will return, and his spirit will live forever. You'll find Serratus at the altar of Serratus, the Drakari Loa of serpents and snakes. However, a visit reveals that the physical form of this Loa is no more. When the Scourge invaded and they began sacrificing their Loa, Sladran, the High Prophet of Serratus, reluctantly played his part in this grim ritual. Though he took no joy in ending his god's existence, he believed it could save their home. In a strange twist, the sacrifice transformed him into something half-serpent, imbued with Serratus's immense power. Fueled by anger at the Scourge, he vowed vengeance for what they compelled him to do to the Loa. In the aftermath of the war against the Jailer, the Bronzebeard brothers explored the altar of Serratus. The report detailed the lingering remnants of Serratus' physical form, skin and bones still visible within the temple. Answering Harkoa's call, daring adventurers embarked on a mission to liberate Akali from his chains from in front of Gundrak. In a swift turn of events, Akali overcame those who sought to subdue him, only to be betrayed by his own prophet. The cunning prophet, coveting Akali's potent blood, orchestrated his demise to absorb a portion of the lowest formidable power. The Argent Stand, a stronghold of the Argent Crusade in Zoldrak, has an interesting origin. It was crafted within a Drakari structure that may have once served as an open-air market. 
The heart of the Argent Stand doubles as an inn, offering a welcome haven for rest. During the war against the Lich King, the Argent Crusade strategically chose this location to fend off the Scourge and protect the second tier of Zoldrak. Despite initial setbacks, the Crusaders remained steadfast, refusing to surrender. Post the conflict with the Jailer, the Bronzewich brothers noted the Argent Stand's enduring strength. This heavily fortified enclave continues to house a resilient population of Crusaders battle in the Scourge. A safe enough place for rest even though the sounds of battle persist as the undead relentlessly test the fortifications. Coramus, a necropolis now lies fallen and tainted south of the altar of Arcoa. The very air surrounding it reeks of blight. When the Scourge descended upon Zoldrak, the Drakari refused to yield, opting to bring down Coramus. However, the crash didn't silence all the Hathar and Arubians within. Led by Malas the Corruptor, undead Hathar and Arubians emerged, and Hathar Necromagi wasted no time raising the fallen, including unfortunate crusaders. Later, the Bronzebeard brothers observed the haunting site. Wreckage protrudes from the landscape, a sickly yellow blight continues to spread from its tainted remains. Standing tall, this formidable fortress holds within its walls a tale steeped in blood and darkness. News of adventurers' exploits in the region prompted the Jakari warlord Zolmaz to seek refuge within the stronghold, guarding his family in the process. However, Zolmaz held a key crucial for the liberation of the last surviving Loa, Akali, prompting the Loa Harkoa to dispatch adventurers on a mission. To breach the enchanted defenses and access the stronghold, the adventurers faced a harrowing task. Eliminate Zolmaz's entire family before confronting the enraged warlord himself. Following the war against the Jailer, the Bronzebeard brothers reported that the grounds remained under vigilant watch, patrolled by warriors adorned with enchanted masks. During the fight against the Lich King, the ancient ice troll stronghold fell into the clutches of the Scourge, all thanks to the betrayal orchestrated by a troll named Drakuru. With the fortress now serving as their sinister base, the Scourge unleashed an invasion upon Zoldrak, and the undead Drakari ice trolls spilled forth from Draktheron Keep into the Grizzly Hills, wreaking havoc on the Firbolg. Strangely, the invasion was falsely attributed to the Drakari, not the Scourge. The once leader of Drak Theron Keep, the Prophet Theronja, underwent a grim transformation into a colossal skeletal wind serpent. He directed his minions towards Zoldrak, aiming to conquer the ancient Ice Troll Empire. It's worth noting that Drak Theron Keep was near Malganus' base during the Third War, where he supposedly met his demise at the hands of Arthas wielding Frostmourne. Years after the war against the Jailer, the Bronzebeard brothers reported that Drakthiron Keep still remained under the control of the Scourge. The undead Drakari's primary objective appeared to be complete destruction of Zoldrak. Within the Keep, you face four bosses that must be conquered. First, you encounter Trollgore. This massive creature realized its legendary fierceness couldn't match the might of the Lich King. Now, it stands as a grim reminder to anyone daring to challenge Arthas' rule. Then you move on to Novos the Summoner, always on the lookout for opportunities yearning to transcend his ordinary existence. In a daring move, the cultist cut out his own heart, offering the still-beating organ to his master just moments before his demise. This bold act left a lasting impression, and his master, in response, transformed him into a lich. You then have the option to face King Dread, a legend among the Drakari. There's a story of a hunting party finding Dread in a habitat saturated with the Scourge Plague. The trolls trained him in hopes that he would have a cure for the devastating plague in their land. The final boss of the dungeon is the Prophet Theronja. This enigmatic Drakari troll prophet, embodying the imposing form of a colossal skeletal wind serpent akin to the avatar of Hakar, renowned for stripping the flesh from even the mightiest ice troll warriors, the Prophet Theronja stands as a chilling figure. Perched upon the upper tiers of the fortress, he oversees the relentless surge of undead trolls streaming from the keep's corridors reinforcing the Scourge in their relentless assault on Zoldrak. Within the ominous Drak Theron Keep, Theronja underwent a transformation, aligning himself with the Scourge as an undead ally. Now there is another dungeon, and that is the capital of Zoldrak, which is Gundrak. Deep within the city's recesses, the sacred shrines are believed to be saturated with the potent mojo of gods laid to rest. Enveloped in this ominous energy, the corrupted Drakari High Prophets thrive, steadily amplifying their influence over devoted followers granting them unparalleled strength. Should this ominous power remain unchecked, the trolls of Gundrak may soon unleash their growing might, throwing the entire region into disarray. The Grand Mosaic Circle, situated before Gundrak's step, serves as the final sanctuary for the twisted Drakari prophets and their Loa, the rhino god Akali. Before liberation could be achieved, Akali fell victim to his prophet, 
who consumed his blood and seized his divine power. For a time, the High Prophets Godara, Morabi, and Sladrin held Gundrak, but the reign was ultimately brought to an end by daring adventurers. After the war against the Jailer, the Bronzebeard brothers ventured to Gundrak and delivered a somber report. The once thriving capital, the pulsating heart of Zoldrak, had been reduced to mere ruins. Now the only inhabitants were the echoes of the dead and the haunting presence of the undead. Now within Gundrak, there are four bosses you will always have to kill, but then there's one optional boss you can do on heroic difficulty. The four consistent bosses are Sladren, the Drakari Colossus, Morabi, and Galdara. And then the optional boss is Ek the Ferocious. Now Sladran took no pleasure in sacrificing the Loa he had served his whole life. But he felt he had no other choice. After sacrificing his Loa, Serratus, and feeling the power surge through his body, he swore that the Scourge would suffer for the atrocities that Drakari trolls were forced to commit. We then have the Drakari Colossus. The trolls' mastery of Mojo and their voodoo magic has been a long-standing tradition. However, they achieved a groundbreaking feat by combining these magical forces to form a golem. The initial triumph paved the way for the birth of countless sentinels, all born from the very first creation, the formidable Colossus. Then you move on to Morabi. Once a high prophet of Mamtuth, the Drakari Mammoth God, Morabi is a Drakari ice troll with a shadowed past. In a desperate move to combat the relentless scourge threat encroaching upon Drakari lands, the tribe sacrificed Mamtuth along with their other animal gods. The grim ritual resulted in the death of the god, transferring Mamtha's immense power directly into the High Prophet Morabi. So while Mamtuth did sacrifice himself and to ensure that his power wouldn't be used by the trolls, the problem was that with his blood being left behind, the prophet was able to actually take the blood and get his power anyways. So that's how he was able to actually get Mamtha's strength and power without performing the big ritual. Or they had to perform a ritual with the blood but either way, Mamtuth didn't have to be around for them to actually perform the ritual. They just needed his blood. But Mamtuth did take a lot of them with him. But now let's move on to the final boss. Meet Galdara. In the face of the Scourge invasion in Zoldrak, the Jakari sought the aid of their Loa. However, their approach was far from the typical plea. Instead, they arrived armed with blades. With Akali, their god falling victim to this brutal betrayal, the High Prophet Galdera and his conspirators seize the lowest strength, drawing power from the bloodshed. Now we have the extra boss you can do if you're on heroic difficulty, Ek. The Drakari, after a series of unsuccessful attempts to weaponize their Gorlock experiment, decided to lock them away. While the Frost Trolls engaged in fierce combat against the invading Scourge, Ek and his minions patiently bided their time, anticipating the eventual release from their confinement. And that's gonna do it for this one. Hopefully you did enjoy. Zoldrak was a lot darker than I remember, although to be honest, I don't really remember much of the older lore, so doing all this is quite fun for me to learn all of this. But I am quite enjoying going back and finding out all this new information that isn't really new, but is new to me. So hopefully you enjoyed. I'll see you in the next one. Do take care of yourself. Thanks for watching.